Okay. I'll call to order the February meeting of the Board of Regents. Ask for approval of the minutes. So move. Second. There is a motion and a second for the minutes. Is there any discussion? Not hearing any. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes. President Kaler, would you share your report with us? Thank you, Mr. Chair. As you know, every year this board and I develop a clear vision and set a firm set of priorities for the course of this university. They guide us about where we want to see the university move and how we will take it there. I produce an annual work plan for you as a roadmap for achieving our goals and taking an even longer view, our ongoing strategic planning process will drive us uh, to a new level of excellence for years to come. And my report to you today in a small way confirms we are aggressively fulfilling our priorities, successfully living up to our vision, and that this year's work plan is being tackled and effectively executed. Let me provide a few examples. A top priority is making our university more accessible, affordable, and diverse. Last month, we established Retaining All Our Students, a new initiative focused on improving the first year retention rate of low-income university students. And low-income students at the University of the Twin Cities, uh, it's about 5,000 students and we will touch over their four years on campus. The retention rate, first to second year, for that cohort is now 87%, which is good, but it's not as good as our overall retention rate for first year students. The program we're developing is unique and is comprised of four components. First, it includes a financial literacy program specifically designed to meet the needs of low-income students and their families. It provides incentives for low-income students to participate in our President's Emerging Scholars Summer Seminar Program. And we know that if students remain connected to education over the summer months, they're more likely to re-enroll in the fall of their second year. Third, we'll build better tracking tools for advisors to monitor the academic progress and enhance these students' advising. And finally, it connects low-income students with peer tutors to help them stay on track academically. As I frequently said, no one graduates in four years if they don't come back for the second one. The program is one more effort to pave the road to an exceptional education for young people from families with limited means. And as you may know, we drew the attention of First Lady Michelle Obama. She specifically mentioned the U at a recent White House summit, and I thought you'd enjoy this short clip. For example, every school offers financial aid services. But listen to what the University of Minnesota is doing. They're committing to expand those services to include financial literacy programs to help students and their families manage the cost of college. So it's nice to be noticed for innovation in promoting accessibility and affordability. Here's another example of advancing our priorities. Operational excellence, as you know, is one of them. OPEX does not only entail reducing administrative costs and making our work processes less cumbersome, as important as those are. It also means listening to a wide range of stakeholders, being forthright and honest about our intentions, and then making wise, timely, and responsible decisions based on the evidence and following a full and fair discussion. And that's exactly what happened last week when a broad-based task force charged by Provost Hansen recommended against merging our College of Biological Sciences and our College of Food, Agriculture, and Natural Resource Sciences. Now, when we embarked on the exploration of that merger, we told faculty, staff, and students, and importantly, we told our friends in the agriculture community that a merger was not a done deal. Some people were skeptical. In the end, the task force listened to many voices, made judgments, and produced recommendations that will, in fact, keep the college, colleges separate. But the task force anticipates more inter-college partnerships, more integration of the two colleges' resources, some shared teaching, long-term research collaboration and cooperatives, and other synergies. I thank the task force for its work, Provost Hansen for her leadership, and I'm really proud of the process. It exhibited a certain amount of institutional courage and risk, but it reflected well on our commitment to collaboration and outreach. Another priority, one that's becoming more pressing recently, is campus safety. We've always worked to make our campuses safe places to study, work, and live, but over the past five months, as you well know, we've faced some challenges on our Twin Cities campus. Amid those challenges, we've made swift and strategic decisions while also strengthening relationships with the city of Minneapolis and other law enforcement and public safety partners. 
And I know you'll be acting later today on more than $4 million in reallocated investments to enhance campus safety. Those investments will support our collaborative, multi-pronged public safety program, and I'm thankful for the hard work and leadership of Vice President Wheelock and Chief Hessness, among others. And I really, really am very pleased with the remarkable engagement of our student leadership uh, in their uh, advocacy and their education of our student body. Thankfully, public safety is not the only story we have to tell. We've been successful in telling our story about our value, that is, the ratio of our excellence to our cost. Two weeks ago, the university was named one of USA Today's and Princeton Review's best value colleges in the nation. And that's a ranking based on excellent academics, generous financial aid, and a manageable cost of attendance. We've been successful in telling our story about how we prepare the talent force for the state and the nation. BestColleges.com recently ranked us in the nation's tw top 25 universities for producing the most Fortune 500 CEOs. It's just one measure of how we prepare students for the workforce and one indication of the success of our alumni. We've also told our story of innovative approaches to teaching and learning and the impact of our system campuses. Recent article in Forbes magazine website praising UM Rochester, our newest campus, and I'll quote, UMR shows that the old-fashioned professor-facing students in a classroom model, that's all one word in Forbes magazine, can be reworked so that it gives serious students a true education at reasonable cost. He continued that UMR seems built for survival in the fast-arriving future where educational programs and institutions sink or swim based on their ability to teach students who want an education and not just a degree. Music to my ears and congratulations to our colleagues at UMR and particularly to Chancellor Limkiel. Meanwhile, at UMD, there's exciting news that advances our commitment as a university to partner with our surrounding community. The Duluth department store, Maurice's, has announced its intention to donate its historic headquarters building to broaden UMD's presence, presence in downtown Duluth. It'll take place in about 18 months and will come to this board, of course, for approval. It's been one of Chancellor Black's priorities to bring UMD more into the Duluth community, and this is a great example of how we can all work with adjacent neighborhoods and cities. Another priority is elevating our relationship with our alumni. Three weeks ago, I dealt with the challenge of the polar vortex by traveling to Naples, Florida. <laughs> and I met with about 200 university alums, and that's where the University of Minnesota Alumni Association, the University of Minnesota Foundation, partnered for our Annie for our annual mini college. And this year was particularly successful. We had six of our top scholars who joined me in sessions with some of my most compelling research, telling us, telling our alumni about the importance of this great research university. It was a great team effort, and another mini college is set for this month in Arizona, and I appreciate the work of UMF and UMAA in organizing these. Back home, of course, we're approaching the legislative session and our partnership with the state of Minnesota remains of critical importance. I've been meeting with lawmakers on both sides of the aisle to talk about our capital request to help ensure that our facilities across the system are state of the art. As you know, Governor Dayton has recommended support for a little more than half of our request. I am an optimist, so I view that as a very good start. I appreciate his support for the university, but we do need to move him and the legislature more fully in support of our request. And as you know, about two nights ago, many of you, along with about 400 of our most committed advocates, attended our legislative briefing and came away, I hope, inspired to communicate with their legislators and the governor. We've asked this group to communicate clearly about our real needs for system-wide renovations through HEPR, for new labs and renovated buildings, for a much-needed new chemical and material science building in Duluth, and a new wellness center in Crookston. So that will be our job front and center for the next few months. And finally, we celebrate the success of our students, faculty, staff, and alumni in and out of the classroom. Most significantly, last week, Professor Ned Mohan of our Electrical and Computer Engineering Department was elected to the prestigious National Academy of Engineering. I'm very proud of him and was delighted to welcome him. And that is in line with my goal of ensuring that our excellent faculty receive the recognition they so richly deserve. I continue to hold student office hours and continue to learn about the concerns, the joys, and the opinions of our students. And it's a good time to celebrate our students and some former student athletes. 
Earlier this week, we learned we jumped into the national top 10 rankings of research universities supplying volunteers to the Peace Corps. We jumped 10 spots among all, all, among all American universities for this important and even patriotic work. On the global stage, as we're speaking, today 25 current Gopher or UMD Bulldog athletes are representing the United States and seven other nations at the Sochi Winter Olympics in men's and women's ice hockey and curling. Closer to home, current students in a Gopher Spirit Squad won two national titles uh, last month for the fifth straight year, and they've been selected to represent the United States at the International Cheer Union World Championships in April. So, I think the evidence is pretty clear and convincing. From Rochester to Sochi, this university's story of success, of efficiency, of transparency, of good decision making and excellence is on display and being heard and told. In closing, I'm giving you an update of my 2013-14 work plan, uh, and I'm pleased that we've pretty methodically and strategically tackled and met uh, our goals, from the strategic planning process to a successful employee engagement efforts to hiring of our new dean of the College of Liberal Arts and our new medical school dean and health science vice president to enhanced outreach to alumni and donors. It's traditional to do this plot in, in red, yellow, and green, uh, but as some of you know, I am colorblind. And so instead, we have a green check, we have a yellow shaded circle, and we have red boxes uh, that we haven't started uh, this year. Uh, this is a halftime report. There's uh, months to go before we're finished, but I think we're on track uh, for another very uh, good year. I appreciate the outstanding work of my senior leadership team, and as always, I'm grateful for your support. With that, Mr. Chair, I complete my report. Thank you, President Kaler. We're off to a very busy and productive start to this calendar year, and we appreciate your efforts and that of your, of your staff. I have a, a number of items to report this morning. On Wednesday evening, I had the pleasure of speaking to over 400 alumni, community members, students, and other members of the Alumni Association's Legislative Network briefing. Several regions joined me in learning firsthand from the university faculty, staff, and students about the impact that our capital request projects will have on research and learning. It was a wonderful event. We continued, we enjoyed continuing the discussion over dinner with state legislative leaders yesterday evening. The board fully supports the university's capital request and will work throughout the session to ensure that the entire system is positioned to serve the higher education needs of Minnesotans. I also want to emphasize the board's strong support for President Kaler's commitment to public safety. I hope that goes without saying. The university has taken a number of steps in recent months to enhance the safety and strengthen our partnership with city leaders. We're pleased to hear the addition of seven officers to the Minneapolis Police Department's second precinct. Regional Mar and I recently attended a welcome reception for the new leaders from the city of Minneapolis and shared our appreciation and commitment to be <coughs> vigilant about campus safety. On December 20th, I had the opportunity to speak at the groundbreaking for the Ambulatory Care Center. It was a wonderful opportunity to mark the beginning of a historic project with our partners, the University of Minnesota Physicians and Fairview Health Systems. Finally, I hope everyone takes a moment to admire the new art on display throughout the sixth floor here at McNamara. The, the, the display features student work across several disciplines. We're pleased to provide additional opportunities for students to showcase their art and highlight the depth and breadth of their talent to all the visitors here. Thank you very much. Okay, well, we have, an, we have a consent report. We have a number of items inside that consent report. If the board has looked at those, I would uh, entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. Move the consent report. Regent second. Rubinius and Regent Cohen have moved and seconded that respectively. Is there any discussion on that? Not hearing any, all those uh, in Jay. favor say aye. 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 Motion uh, against, motion passes. And Vice President Herman, would you come forward? Vice President Herman has been waiting patiently since November, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, we were unable to accommodate his uh, presentation at that time. And uh, yeah, so this this presentation will even be bigger and better, and 
uh, with the two months that have passed. Uh, this is uh, his annual report on the status of the university research and commercialization of intellectual property. Yeah. Research, of course, is a critical component of our mission. And it's important to understand the trends in productivity and benchmarking against our peers. We're pleased to have you here today, Vice President Herman, to provide us with your report. Well, thank you, Chair Beeson, Vice Chair Johnson, Regents, President Kaler, and friends. I want to start by wishing everyone a happy Valentine's Day. And just want to make sure everybody realizes that if they haven't got their flowers sent yet, it's, it's a little too late. Um, <laughs> I want to thank you for the opportunity to come and speak with you today. I'm honored to present my first uh, State of the Research report as the Vice President for Research here at the University of Minnesota. Now, when I was here last summer, uh, it was to speak about my first 100 days at the university and to identify both successes and challenges we face as a research enterprise amidst constraints. Today, I will build upon those remarks in addition to presenting our annual research report uh, and our annual accountability report. I will present our latest performance measures, including the fiscal year 2013 and five-year trends of sponsored research funding at the university, an update of our technology commercialization results, and a comparative analysis of our research activity as measured against our regional, national, and global peers. As you will see, these performance measures continue to show a strong research enterprise sustaining its ranking and performance among an elite group of research institutions. But today is as much about discussing opportunity as it is about sharing data. Here I provide a look at the path forward for our research enterprise and how progress through our own state and university efforts have helped position us for success. Finally, I will share with you the research strategic plan our community has developed that includes our vision, our cornerstone beliefs, and our goals. Our faculty, university leaders, and community all contributed greatly to the results and the vision you see here. In short, I hope this report helps to illustrate the university's strengths, the opportunities we have, and why this strategic path forward is critical to our future success in research at the University of Minnesota. And in return, I hope to offer you a chance for a robust and informative discussion about the path ahead for the university's future. Now, I'll first lead you through slides that may be familiar with, as presented on previous occasions, sponsored awards by college uh, and by source. The University of Minnesota faculty and staff competed successfully for $693 million in sponsored research funding in fiscal year 2013. And as you can see on this slide, sponsored awards by college and campus, funding by college declined across the board except for the College of Biological Sciences and the School of Public Health. And I will speak more about public health secret sauce in just a few minutes. The arrows indicate either increases or decreases by dollar amount in millions of dollars from the previous fiscal year 2012. The total amount of funding received is also listed. Increases and decreases are shown for most but not all colleges. The total award amount was down 56 million or 7.5% from the total for fiscal year 2012. Now what you will see in this next slide, sponsored awards by source, is a similar picture to the first slide. Funding decreases by source were seen in every funding category except for the National Science Foundation. NSF awards were up 26.9% for fiscal year 2013, and this can be attributed to nine awards over $2 million this year compared with four awards in fiscal year 2012. The NIH and the NSF continue to account for about 70% of the federal total research funding at the university. Now before moving on, I want to offer a quick side note for clarification on different sets of numbers we will be discussing today. I've just finished summarizing award funding for the past fiscal year. And as you may already know, an award is a commitment to multi-year funding coming into the university research enterprise. It is important to look at award funding trends, which is why I will show this same award data over a five-year period. As I move to national and global comparisons, the discussion will change from award data to expenditure data, 
which is more commonly used for comparison purposes across institutions. Now, to gain some uh, additional perspective on research funding more broadly, we've included data that provides a comparative analysis of schools in the Big Ten over the past five years. Uh, this slide shows the CIC, or Committee on Institutional Cooperation Comparison. The CIC is commonly referred to as the Big Ten. As you can see, the University of Minnesota ranked third amongst the Big Ten for awards totals received at the institution. Additionally, you can see the majority of universities here have either decreased in their award amounts or remained flat for the same period of time. The exception to this slide is Michigan, which again showed an increase for the second year in a row. Now this data demonstrates that a majority of universities cannot simply afford to rely on unpredictable federal funding and remain competitive in the long run. As I mentioned earlier, amidst the numbers analysis, there are some great success stories that we should not lose sight of. While I could speak to the great work being done at any number of our colleges, one of those stories comes from the School of Public Health, where we saw moments ago a sizable award increase of nearly $89 million for the college, due in large part to the work of Dr. James Neaton. Dr. Neaton, a professor of biostatistics, is recognized internationally for his significant discoveries in the treatment and prevention of disease and building capacity worldwide for conducting large-scale health research. While Dr. Neaton brings in many awards, two NIH awards totaling $34.9 million stand out in fiscal year 2013 for his HIV study, the International Network for Strategic Initiatives in Global HIV Trials, or INSIGHT. He and his INSIGHT team have conducted randomized clinical trials at over 400 clinical sites in 37 countries and have enrolled more than 14,000 people with HIV. Findings from the study have changed clinical practice guidelines globally, opened up new avenues for HIV researchers, and improved the health of countless peoples. I would also be remiss if I didn't speak to the new incoming medical school dean and VP for Health Sciences, Dr. Brooks Jackson, who will officially arrive at the university on Monday. An internationally recognized researcher in HIV diagnostics, prevention, and treatment, he has been the principal investigator on a $500 million NIH internationally funded project on maternal and pediatric AIDS clinical trials, and he has helped Johns Hopkins Pathology Department rise from fifth to first place nationwide in NIH funding. We look forward to his leadership and contributions that will help our university community grow in considerable ways. As we move to the next slide, we see the year-to-year -year variations in our research funding throughout the past five years. Without funding from the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, or ERA, included, the university's funding has remained stable, consistent, and competitive. In fiscal year 2013, ERA funds dropped to 749,000, down from a high water mark of 131.4 million in fiscal year 2010. Throughout the duration of the ERA funding, the university received a total of 251.6 million uh, in ERA funds, the second highest amount uh, in the Big Ten behind Michigan. What is also important to note is that the university was the second largest recipient of ERA funding in the state behind the Minnesota Department of Transportation. This allocation demonstrates the university's significant role in the state's economic, social, and physical infrastructure. As ERA concludes, we note that the university grew its total award funding 14% during the five years ERA funding was available. As we all know, unfortunately, ERA was designed to stimulate the economy in the short term and hopefully afford us at the university some time to figure out how to respond to a future that could include economic uncertainty and flat or decreasing support in award funding, as we'll see on the next slide. <coughs> this slide shows research funding for the past five years in those colleges with over 15 million in total awards. In the first column on this slide, colored gray, we see that the overall funding for the university has remained relatively flat. However, we must also note that some of the colleges bucked the trend of flat growth, as the slide shows a positive percent 
uh, change in their funding between the start and the end of the five-year period. In these colleges, there are lessons we can learn from and hopefully offer guidance to the university community on steps that can be taken to mimic that growth. This positive change in many of these colleges can be attributed to new and dynamic leadership and a strong college-wide commitment to pursuing new sources of funding, such as we saw in the example of Dr. Neaton. I want to make it clear that I, we believe they should be commended for their achievements, hard work, especially during these challenging economic times. But given the minimal growth in recent years of the university's overall total, much of our work ahead will need to be focused on finding new and innovative ways to address these challenges and maintain our competitive edge. And while we have faced some real challenges related to unstable federal support, fiscal year 2013 data out of our Office for Technology Commercialization is very promising. It points to a strong performance and continued productivity among our research faculty in the technology commercialization realm. A record 14 startup companies were launched based upon University of Minnesota research and innovation, which upstaged the previous year's record of 12 startups. I want to now call out two metrics in particular that have changed, invention disclosures and MinIP agreements. The invention disclosures metric is one that has steadily grown in a positive direction uh, during the past five years. What is new this year is that it has become one of the five accountability measures that the university will track in order to receive 1% of its biennial appropriation from the state. And given our performance to date, I am confident we are on track to meet this measure in 2014. Additionally, we will now track the annual number of MinIP or Minnesota Innovation Partnerships agreements as part of our technology commercialization metrics. Through MinIP, we are making it easier for businesses to work with the university, sponsor research, and in a word, innovate. Known nationally for its groundbreaking approach to make it easier for business to work with the university research community, MinIP is designed to improve access to university-developed technologies while reducing the risk and costs associated with sponsoring research and licensing intellectual property. By the end of fiscal year 2013, 55 new sponsored research agreements had been signed through the MinIP program. This program has been called a game changer by many, and we are excited that the University of Minnesota and our MinIP program have been called out as an example of excellence by the White House. It seems the White House is recognizing lots of excellent things here at the university. MinIP is recognized as a national model that helps to support university industry partnerships. And because of the positive feedback and success of the program thus far, we have recently expanded the program into two parts to enable companies not only to sponsor research at the university, but also to take already developed university technologies for a test run. We call this new program MinIP Try It, Buy It Now. We're excited to see that this important and innovative program received national attention as good policy, and we look forward to more good things to come from the MinIP platform. We're now going to turn to review the research and development expenditures from the National Science Foundation's annual R&D survey and peer performance of the nation's top 15 research universities. While there's no one agreed upon national ranking system, the NSF R&D expenditure measure continues to be recognized as a reliable and strong indicator of total research performance. Among public research universities, the University of Minnesota ranks ninth remaining among the elite public universities with the Twin Cities campuses posting over 826 million in research expenditures and as a university system generating over 849 million. There is one important note to make mention of here. The survey as of 2010 change reporting requirements where all institutions must report by campus even though the University of Minnesota system acts as a single enterprise when it comes to its research. Also included in this side are two other widely accepted and cited ranking systems, the Center for Measuring University Performance and the Academic Ranking of World Universities. And in both of these uh, rankings, Minnesota retained its strong position uh, in this past year. 
Now, as we saw earlier, and in the headlines such as this one by the NSF highlighting the stagnation of expenditures, we see the university in danger of remaining on a flat growth trajectory. Now, we here at the University of Minnesota think we can chart a different path forward rather than follow the uninspiring course offered through this federal funding narrative. It's a path that makes better, more efficient use of our resources, one that grows productive and robust partnerships with, at the university and with non-university organizations to create new knowledge, and one that offers direction, establishing us as a leader and convener of these new ideas in order to solve the looming and significant challenges of the future. To take this path and to achieve these goals, we must transform our research enterprise. Now, I will discuss the steps we are taking at the university to achieve this ambitious vision and to challenge this flat growth trajectory, or what I like to call the new normal. In my July 2013 Board of Regents presentation, Achieving Success Amidst Constraints, research priorities and infrastructure, and after my first 100 days in office, I presented you with a vision for the future of the research here at the University of Minnesota, which builds upon the university's strengths. As you may recall seeing, these emerging priorities at that time were the following, as shown on this slide. I believe in partnership with our faculty, research community, university system, and the president's office, we have started on the path to achieving research results and research success as presented through these priorities. Now success in part takes shape through our development of transdisciplinary and public-private partnerships. A way to more simply represent this collaborative relationship is through the triple helix model of innovation and business development. What the model represents is the complex and dynamic relationship that takes place between the entrepreneurial university business and industry partners, and government entities. The goal of this intricate and interconnected partnership is to create an innovation ecosystem that thrives on the combination of knowledge creation capabilities, such as those located at universities, with the need of our for-profit and non-profit partners, along with the policies, investments, and oversight of the government to support the ecosystem. Stanford and North Carolina have already adopted this philosophy and model, and as evidenced by national news and rankings, they remain leaders in academic and regional innovation. Uh, these partnerships, like the structure of the Triple Helix, need to become part of our own research DNA at the university if we are to move our enterprise away from the new normal of flat growth. Now we are making strides in further developing the third strand of this triple helix, or our business partnerships at the university. I'm pleased to announce that beginning this February, we've launched an Office of University Economic Development. Our Office of Business Relations has done a great job working with industry and outside partners. However, our capacity has been limited and the need to more effectively connect system-wide resources and engage outside partners became clear during our strategic planning process. And I'll speak more about this process and our progress in just a few moments. As you can see by this slide, many groups at the university are currently involved in economic development related activities. This list shows only a sample of those activities, which means that alignment is needed if we are to present a unified front or widen our open door policy to our external partners. This office will work with industry and our institution to develop an economic development plan that complements and facilitates activities within the colleges and individual units and works with these and external stakeholders to implement new economic initiatives that stem from our university's research and entrepreneurial activities. I will have more updates on this important office and its role later in the year. Additionally, the state of Minnesota has already shown true leadership by laying the groundwork to help us build on this triple helix model through the passage of MinDrive, or Minnesota Discovery Research and Innovation Economy legislation. This is Minnesota's version of the triple helix. As you can see by the representatives on our advisory board, our partners on this initiative are impressive and varied and fit the transdisciplinary model we are striving for. MinDrive was designed to help us work with each other in different and new ways so that the state, industry, and the university 
can together tackle the challenges of the future, strengthen the economy, and advance research. Currently, the multidisciplinary programs under the MinDrive initiative have been authorized to use nearly $19 million to build out the initiative's infrastructure, hire leading faculty and graduate students, foster relationship with Minnesota's businesses, and secure resources needed to innovate. By utilizing MinDrive and by building upon our emerging priorities that have been identified through the strategic planning process, as you will see in a minute, we are making progress to ensure that the university remains competitive as a research leader and that we will continue to innovate beyond the current environment of flat growth funding for university research. Now, in May 2013, the Office of the Vice President for Research, in partnership with the university and the research community, embarked upon a strategic planning process designed specifically to advance the university's research mission and bring increased focus, alignment, and excellence to the university-wide research enterprise over the next five years. The Roman philosopher Seneca said, it is not because things are difficult that we do not dare. It is because we do not dare that things are difficult. Putting in place a new strategic plan and changing the course of our future will be hard. But as we've seen through this process, our community is up for and has called for the challenge. Now, during the strategic planning process, the Office of the Vice President for Research engaged a broad and diverse community of close to 4,000 individuals on our five campuses, in our surrounding businesses and nonprofit communities, representing 65 different stakeholder groups. Input from these groups came through a number of ways, through online surveys, interviews, targeted focus groups, meetings, and public forums. The responses were encouraging. We found clear consistency amongst the themes and support of the vision in our stakeholder responses. Once our initial phase of gathering data was complete, we also asked outside consultants as well as internal experts to analyze the data using both quantitative and qualitative measures. Also during this phase, we mapped out what we heard into a SWOT analysis, a strengths, weakness, opportunity, and threat framework to help us better understand the current position in the university's research enterprise as a whole. Now included in this helpful tool is your input that we gathered during your October strategic planning work session. The feedback from you and these various stakeholder groups combined with the guidance and the OVR, OVPR leadership team has resulted in this plan called Five Years Forward Through Collective Inspiration and Discovery. It's a plan that concentrates on four thematic areas or cornerstones in line with our vision of bringing people together in new ways, fostering discoveries, and making our world a better place. The four themes that our community has come to agree on include the following. We will enhance research excellence by investing in research infrastructure and faculty and educating our students for the industries of tomorrow. We will accelerate the transfer of knowledge by creating opportunities for public-private partnerships that move information out of the ivory tower and into the community where we can do the most good. We will advance transdisciplinary partnerships by encouraging collaboration between researchers among disciplines to derive new concepts and approaches and enable new ways of understanding. And we will promote a culture of serendipity where researchers can come together across departments, colleges, and disciplines, and with colleagues and communities outside the university to think creatively and cultivate new ideas. Now, within each of these four thematic areas, we have identified a total of 16 specific goals that speak to the needs and areas where this institution should focus its resources, attention, talent, and energy, and ultimately forge its path forward. These goals represent the voice of our research community, the university's leadership, as well as our partners outside the university. They include specific ways for us to realize and reach our university's research aspirations represented through the four cornerstones. For example, we will grow and recruit more honorific award-winning faculty. We will develop metrics and incentives to motivate transdisciplinary research. We will grow and support innovative partnerships with research and with industry, not only through MinDrive, but also through other initiatives. And we will create or find tools and resources to support this new research culture. 
I think it's important to mention that even though we have come a long way in developing this plan and have arrived at the vision which will guide us, we really see this as a beginning of an ongoing iterative and collaborative process. We will continue to seek the guidance and input of all of our stakeholder groups as we put this plan into action. Over the next few months, we will work with the university leadership, President Kaler's office, the university strategic planning process, and others in the community to develop a strong implementation plan that will incorporate continued stakeholder engagement, establish common goals, identify world-class initiatives, and align with the university's strategic vision. Leads and work teams from across the university system are being invited to help implement the goals, and with their help, we will design specific action plans to ensure we have put in place the right measures for success and align the right resources with these plans. During this process, we will re-engage our stakeholders to ensure our action plans meet the goals set forth by the strategic vision and plan. And to help ensure that this plan stays focused and aligned with our system-wide strategic planning process, goals, and mission, we have invited leaders and experts from many fields across the university to help provide guidance as our executive steering committee. The members of this committee are ones that have proven track records of, records of success, are forward-thinking, and also represent a broad range of activities and areas of focus that are priorities for our university. But please know this. While our office helped lead and facilitate the planning effort, this strategic plan is not ours to own alone. This is a university-wide path forward. This plan was intended to inform the research mission of the institution, which is a mission that requires all parts to work together in the same direction with the same goals in mind if we are to be successful. Now, as a researcher myself and as the VP for research here at the university, I believe researchers are, at their core, visionaries working to transform society. This has inspired my own work, and it is what inspires me to come to work every day here at the university. Uh, Albert Einstein was also such a visionary, and he said the measure of intelligence is the ability to change. Now, at an event we held this past fall to thank those working in our office for their efforts, passion and innovation. I handed out these mugs with Einstein's words on them, which I also presented back to you in December as an early Christmas present. And as a reminder that the new course we are charting together requires culture change. By embracing change and building upon the university's existing strengths, we can unlock the tremendous potential to refine and transform our research enterprise in a way that will advance research increase our competitive advantage nationally, internationally, and generate new knowledge and discoveries. In short, this means our collective goal is our research vision of bringing people together in new ways, fostering discoveries, and making our world a better place. And when I began this present presentation, I mentioned today was also an opportunity uh, for discussion, and so now I turn to you for your input, as well as to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Vice President Herman. Uh, President Kaler, would you like to add a few comments to? Uh, I'm not sure that I can, Chair Beeson. Um, it's a pretty spectacular story. <clears throat> I'm struck by the fact that uh, I'm fortunate to lead this institution. You're fortunate to govern this institution. Uh, we sometimes, in our day-to-day -day work, lose track of the fact that uh, this is an absolutely excellent university, one of the world's leading research institutions and a place that uh, we all should be very proud of. So I commend uh, Vice President Herman for an excellent presentation, uh, and I hope you're as inspired by the future as I am. Thank you, President Kaler. I'd like to add that uh, I, I appreciate, I know the board does, the um, focus of the report not only on, uh, on the look back uh, over the past year and the annual report that it is, but the uh, focus and um, uh, energy that went into laying out a roadmap for uh, future research activity and economic development more broadly. Okay, I'm going to open this up to the board for questions and comments on this, uh, starting with uh, Regent Larson. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Herman, um, being that this is a people-driven 
initiative. Without having the right people on the bus, chances of having significant success is diminished. Do we have a process in place that measures the types of talents and traits that researchers have within our institution and how they measure up to those values slash goals. Vice President Herman. Uh, Chair Beeson and uh, Regent Larson, let me attempt to answer that uh, by saying the following. Um, I do think that as you've seen through this report and as President Kale has indicated, the university is doing a good job already in a number of different measures, in a number of different metric systems, whether it's funding, whether it's national or international rankings. Uh, uh, and just yesterday we had some of our, three of our faculty members talk about some very broad uh, areas of collaboration and partnership and research that are really going to end up adding significant benefit to our society as a whole. So I think if you use those as metrics of measurement of success, we do a very good job. And it's not just restricted to the few people we've heard about. The, one of the great aspects of this university is it's got great uh, breadth of expertise across many different areas. So I think that uh, the people here uh, certainly are capable and will be very successful in implementing this plan. I think the opportunity for us is to provide a sort of a structure to bring those people together, share the vision, and figure out in practical terms how we move forward and reach these goals and how we measure our ability to reach those goals. So. It's defining the goals and the strategies, the accountability metrics, and then finding the resources to match to, to make those possible. So I would say that um, there's tremendous excellence uh, across this university in many different areas. And I think, uh, as we found through the strategic planning process, there was tremendous enthusiasm to do this. And there's tremendous uh, excitement about the ability to kind of um, enhance the already substantial success we have. Thank you. Thank you. Regent Allen. Uh, thank you again for a, a very good report. Um, I have a question that it, it may, you may not be able to answer today. It may take longer or may take some more research. But uh, one thing I don't know as, as a regent is, is this. You go back to the 60s and early 70s, Minnesota was home to some of the fastest and biggest uh, computers in the world. Uh, we've become far more dependent on those for all kinds of science and engineering work. But the rest of the world has caught up in producing those same computers uh, these days. My question is, do we have a first class uh, computing system for supporting our scientists and engineers in the work that they do today? And do we have the uh, proper pricing policies for their use that uh, help them win and execute awards? So let me, um, let me answer that by reminding you, uh, Regent Allen, that when I was here in July, one of the uh, eight things on my list of priorities was informatics. And so uh, one of the things I did not talk about uh, today is that we have recently established the University of Minnesota Informatics Institute and funded that institute with some recurrent funding specifically to, to build upon what currently exists here in terms of both physical and intellectual infrastructure in the uh, world of informatics. So I would say that, um, that there is not a, a thing that any of us do in our daily lives that doesn't involve technology and the use of information. And no matter what industry you're in going forward, uh, that is a tremendously pressing need. It's a message our industry partners have delivered to us strongly, and it's one that we are trying to step up and address not only for our own uh, science here, but, but others. Uh, having said that, we've invested, I'm sure, like most institutions have, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars in information technology infrastructure. And again, I would, I would uh, suggest that, that uh, those investments um, have been substantial. 
and I think provide us an opportunity to kind of better integrate what we already have here and make it more effective. So I think we're on our way. Uh, I think it's always a, a situation where uh, uh, the technology advances so fast, you know, Murphy's Law is, is, is in play here, and that it's very hard to keep up. But I think the university has made a significant commitment already and has, and has put this as a top priority of a continuing investment to make sure that our, our research and education uh, activities can remain uh, uh, outstanding. Thank you. Regent Simmons. Um, thank you. Vice President Herman, thank you so much. This shows a, a lot of creativity and insights into what's around us. I really appreciate it. I'd like to ask you to look to the future for us and help us see um, what's going to happen in terms of research funding and how it affects the university. So our largest source of funding, of course, is the federal government with NIH and NSF. How are we going to compete there, given the pretty flat expectations, I think, of dollars? And after you answer that, then maybe move and talk about any um, opportunities to go after more aggressively of other sources of research funding? Well, I think that um, it, the, the future for federal funding is, is very uncertain and at best is going to remain flat. Uh, NIH and NSF both got a little bit of a boost in the recent agreement, but it's still below the funding levels that were there when George Bush entered <coughs> office. So, and, and if you account for inflation in this process, the purchasing power is down about 35% now. So um, it's a very difficult um, business to run in any way to even, even keep your head above water. Uh, and so I think we need to diversify our research funding portfolio, and I think we need to diversify it across all um, <clears throat> possible avenues. Uh, I've tried to indicate in my speech that, you know, 70% of our funding comes from the federal government. I think we just can't depend on that going forward, and we have to be able to develop more industry public-private partnerships. Uh, we have to do things in ways that allow us to leverage investments. Uh, I think the Min Drive is, is a very exciting um, uh, structure because I think one of the things it's done is it's really going to make Minnesota more competitive nationally for talent, given that most other states are divesting in their higher education institutions and public research institutions. And here we've now created basically what's a $350 million endowment that could be used to enhance research in areas that, that are important to the state. So I think that we need to look for opportunities um, uh, wherever we can. We need to do a better job of communicating to our stakeholders about why this is important, why research is critical. We need to uh, convince the people who are uh, ardent supporters of the university to continue to, to support the university and enhance their support. So I think we have to look at a number of different opportunities to enhance our fiscal support. And then the other side I would say is that, you know, we've, We've reported before to the HR uh, subcommittee of the board that 42% of our faculty time is spent on mm, administrative activities. We need, to, we need to change that. We need to decrease that and we need to allow them to, I mean, you're basically tying one hand behind your back and you're decreasing the productivity by half before you even walk in the door. We need to do a better job of getting some of that overhead and that administrative burden out of the process. Thank you. I'm going to ask, uh, we're going to be running uh, short of time right now, Vice President, so if we could um, go to the next question, um, Regent McMillan. And we may, we'll, we'll want to continue this conversation at the committee level, a number of the committees through this next year. Thank you, Chair Beeson, and thank you, Vice President Herman. Um, I applaud you for the vision, the cornerstones, the supporting goals that you've got there. I think that is a framework that uh, there's a lot to like there. Um, you mentioned at one point, and I'm looking at your slide 25, a university-wide approach. And, uh, and when I look at that list of the folks on the Executive Steering Committee, it doesn't look very university-wide, but let me ask the question not in a, in a narrow context, but in a big one. Our land grant mission, our resource-based and ag industries are out and about and closer connected with our 
you know, whether it's the Northwest Research and Outreach Center up in Crookston, NRI in Duluth, Hormel in Austin, whatever, there's a lot of examples. How do we make sure we're leveraging all of those resources and the strengths they bring to the resource engine? Because this looks kind of, you know, Twin Cities centric here, and I'm just concerned that we're doing everything we can to leverage those strengths and reach out to those industries that need so much of our help. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Regent McMillan. I think that's an excellent question. I would say um, a couple of things. So first of all, um, the group here is a steering committee or an executive committee. And what will happen is that we will ask this group to identify co-leads for each of those 16 goals that we have. Those co-leads will come from across the university system, not just the Twin Cities campus. That's number one. Uh, number two, those co-leads then will go out and put together uh, task forces, for lack of a better word, who will develop the actual action plans and the accountability metrics. That will be a system-wide activity. So that's a second point. I think a third point is that uh, along with the strategic plan, the MinDrive initiative has actually created quite a bit of uh, collaboration and conversation across the university system. And I, I think that um, both Morris and Duluth uh, certainly uh, uh, rec will recognize benefit from that activity. Uh, I've had conversations with Crookston very recently about how, th how we might be able to help them as well. Um, so I would say that um, while this is a piece of the puzzle, it's not the only piece of the puzzle, and there are a number of other aspects of um, opportunity. The last example I would give is I've said we've opened a new office of university economic development and we specifically are, are looking forward to working very closely with the office of economic development on the UMD campus as a major uh, partner in gaining uh, um, interaction with our northern, northern uh, partners. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Regent um, Divine, your question and comments been covered then? Yeah. Thank you. Regent Broad? Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Vice President Herman. It was worth the wait. Um, I wanted to thank you for your strategic pros, approach, the expertise, and your leadership uh, in bringing this together. My question is, how do we take advantage of the transdisciplinary um, partnerships that you talk about in the triple helix while recognizing the real some of the real weaknesses that you pointed out in, in the approach of silos, complexity, proliferation of research centers, unless we rationalize or further centralize some of our operational uh, side of things. Well, I, let me make a couple of points if I could. So, so um, I want to make sure we all understand that even though we say transdisciplinary, interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, the word discipline is part of any, all of those words. So we need to have strong disciplines that exists that we can bring together. The inner and multidisciplinary work at bringing together disciplines uh, in different ways, transdisciplinary really means maybe taking those disciplines and combining them in ways that create a new uh, discipline that's more maybe topical and important for the, for the work going forward. Um, I think that one of the things that's in our, uh, that was coming out from our strategic plan is that, that people wanted us to think about ways to incent people to be able to um, work in a more collaborative, more cooperative fashion. And um, uh, so um, some of this involves um, who, who gets uh, the intellectual property rights. Some of this involves who gets the indirect costs. Some of this involves who gets credit and where they are in the publication. So, you know, there's a number of things that people recognize as potential um, uh, disincentives that I think we have to work together as a community to kind of figure out. Uh, I think the university has taken a very bold step um, uh, with some of their tenure and promotion policies that now state collaboration is important as part of the assessment of your progress in tenure and promotion. Uh, so the university's taken a stand on that. I think that that needs to continue to move into the university and needs to be better uh, explained and understood by the university. So I think that there are a number of things that um, we understand are issues, silos and centers, and set, et cetera. Uh, so I think that we need to look where we can for opportunities to bring those together in ways that create uh, added value rather than duplicative value. 
Um, and then I would, I would just echo the words of the president that, you know, as part of the overall university strategic planning process, we, we not only have to ask what are we going to do, but what are we not going to do? And that has to be part of the conversation. Thank you, Vice President Herman, on behalf of the board, mm -hmm. very much we'll look forward to this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Durfee. Good morning, and you would share your report with the board. Thank you. Chair Beeson, President Kaler, and members of the board. This is the second of the three academic year reports provided by the Faculty Consultative Committee to the Board of Regents. And on behalf of my colleagues in faculty governance, I thank you for this opportunity to address the board and inform you about some of the topics that are of interest to faculty. I will start with graduate education. In September, I described how important graduate education is to the faculty and reported on the formation of the Special Committee on Graduate Education jointly charged by the Provost and the Faculty Consultative Committee and chaired by Professor Scott Lanyon. The committee was given a short timeline to tackle significant issues including financing graduate education, the graduate student experience and program quality, enrollment management, and the visibility and quality of graduate education. That 36 distinguished faculty, students and staff would unhesitatingly volunteer their services to be on this committee is strong evidence of the importance of graduate education. On December 17th, the committee delivered their final report, which sets the stage with insightful comments on the state of graduate education at the University of Minnesota, and then offers a slate of recommendations to strengthen the research capacity of the university and its ability to train the next generation of scholars and leaders. The SEC joins all university stakeholders in expressing its thanks and gratitude to members of the committee, and in particular to the subcommittee chairs, Professors Wayne Gladfelter, George Hempel, Karen Ho, and Carissa shively Sloterback for working rapidly yet thoughtfully to bring graduate education to center stage. Now, sidebar, this is the same Professor Shively Slaughterback that the Academic and Student Affairs Committee heard from yesterday when she described the innovative interdisciplinary activities of the Resilient Communities Project that connects local communities and university researchers who together work on developing and implementing projects related to sustainability. This is a big project. And then I also learned five minutes ago from Vice President Herman that she's on the Executive Steering Committee for, to implement the strategic plan of Vice President uh, uh, for, for Research at the University. So how could she also have found the time to play a key role in the examination of graduate education? <laughs> She was preceded yesterday by Professor Tim Ebner, who not only is leading one of the MinDrive thrusts, but was also a key driver of a $33 million grant proposal submitted last fall and is a department head. He too was on the Graduate Education Committee. How did he find the time? The answer is that Carissa and Tim found the time because they made the time, and they made the time because graduate education is important to them as well as it is to all other committee participants and to the faculty here at the University of Minnesota. So what's next? We're in the phase of examining the report and its recommendations. The report has been released to uh, graduate faculty, students, and staff. Comments are being received. Uh, Professor Lanyon has been uh, discussing the report with faculty governance and other groups, and the intent is to get as much input as possible from all corners. But the purpose of this activity is not to end with the discussion, but to end with action. <clears throat> Some of the recommendations made by the committee could be acted upon in the near future, while others require more analysis, particularly those changes that might impact budgetary considerations. I expect my June report to the board to include a summary of the changes that have been implemented and the ones that continue to be examined. Those of you on the Academic and Student Affairs Committee yesterday heard a report on graduate education planning from Acting Dean Sally Colesfeld with their docket materials containing even more details about the challenges and opportunities facing graduate education. The information in her report and the observations and recommendations of the special committee will also inform and be rolled into strategic planning. So stay tuned, a lot is happening. So what can the board do about graduate education? I have a concrete suggestion. I urge the board to keep graduate education high on its radar screen. We are the only research university in the state of Minnesota, and the main reason we can excel at our research mission is graduate education. 
The faculty may set the directions for research, but the graduate students are the ones who make it happen. Therefore, I request that in your oversight role, you continue to encourage and push the administration and faculty to provide the absolute best in graduate education and to make the University of Minnesota the place where the very best students come to receive their advanced education. I'm not asking you to tell us what degree programs to cut, nor to get and dive into the nuances of five-year support offers, but I am asking you to say, yes, this is important, this matters to the university, and to the state of Minnesota, and we will work with you to make sure that the University of Minnesota excels in graduate education. The second topic I would like to briefly address is evaluation of curriculum and academic programs. The foundation of a university is in its curriculum and academic programs, and ownership of these programs belongs to the faculty. We have recently started and will continue to be in a period where faculty must examine their curriculum under the lens of outcomes, and, and this is something new for universities nationwide. For some programs, this has come through participation in the Writing and Rich Curriculum Initiative, part of the overall university effort to improve undergraduate writing, where participation in this program requires faculty to articulate what specific writing abilities are required by students who graduate in their major and ensure their curriculum provides students with those abilities. Faculty and engineering programs recently underwent examination by ABET, the accreditation authority, and that examination requires that we define what outcomes are, effect, are expected by our students and how our curriculum enables the students to meet those outcomes. Upcoming is the accreditation of the entire university undergraduate program where the student learning outcomes will be closely examined. And then also upcoming are proposals for regular reviews of all graduate and undergraduate programs. And then we have the Council on Liberal Education, the Campus Writing Board, and the Campus Curriculum Committee, all charged with evaluating and approving various aspects of new undergraduate course proposals. As faculty, we recognize that examination and approval processes are needed for a functioning university, and we also recognize that faculty must have the ability to change and structure our courses and curriculum in ways that best serve the education of our students. Over the coming months, faculty, including faculty governance, will continue to be engaged in the evolution of accreditation and program review processes to ensure that the process of examination and approval are meaningful and are compatible with the education goals set by the faculty and result in high quality education for our students. The third and final topic I'll discuss is faculty engagement. Yesterday, the Faculty and Staff Affairs Committee was briefed by Vice President Kathy Brown and her team on the results of the employee engagement survey that was completed by faculty and staff. Committee members discussed the 47% faculty response rate to the survey, and some wondered whether it was sufficient to validate the survey results. Actually, my colleagues and I were excited that the response rate was so high because, quite frankly, faculty can be an ordinary species that are notoriously resistant to filling out surveys. <laughs> but it's not necessary to get a 100% response. You just need a representative sample, which I think we got. And what really matters is the local level discussions that are triggered by the survey results. Faculty will work with administrators at the at the university, college, and department level to discuss these results and see how we might build on our strengths and address any concerns. As I just mentioned, the local level discussions are where the action is. For faculty, this is in our department because this is where we teach, where we center our research, and where we spend most of our time. Already in my college, uh, Dean Crouch has start, shared the engagement survey results with CSE department heads who are beginning to have discussions with faculty and staff in the respective departments and the same is happening in other colleges. In a month or two, faculty will also hear the results of the coach survey of faculty job satisfaction. The last time this survey was administered was 2005 and resulted, among other things, in changes to the tenure and promotion processes at the University of Minnesota and to establish a new comprehensive uh, uh, orientation for new faculty that has helped our youngest faculty members to succeed. We expect to use the results from the 2013 survey to ensure that the University of Minnesota continues to be a premier place for faculty to teach, perform, research, and engage our communities through outreach. Chair Beeson, members of the board, that concludes my report and I invite your questions. Thank you, Professor Durfee, for the report and the work of your colleagues. I don't see any questions at the moment, so uh, thank you again. Next, I'd like to invite up Vice President 
Patrice Albert to the table to discuss equity and diversity efforts here at the University of Minnesota. And I'd appreciate it if President Kaler could preview this topic. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, in November of 2011, shortly after I began as president of this university, uh, I made an important decision, and that was uh, in, fa in the face of a reduction in administrative structure that we were beginning and has continued, I decided to leave the Office of Equity, Diversity, Leadership a position at the vice president uh, level, and that was, uh, I hope, a clear message uh, to the community uh, about my value for equity and diversity work uh, at uh, this university. It's a simple fact that an institution uh, that fails to connect with the changing diversity of our nation, our state, our metro area, our neighborhoods, uh, will simply fail. Uh, this is critically important, mission central work uh, for us. Uh, we also have an obligation to fight uh, the inequities uh, that uh, plague our society and our city and our schools. Uh, we looked a long time uh, to find the right person to lead uh, this organization. I'm absolutely delighted uh, that after that search process, uh, Dr. Catrice Albert has joined the University of Minnesota. Uh, I've been absolutely delighted to have her as a colleague in the short period of time uh, she's been here. Uh, she has a great insight, uh, an iron backbone, and a terrific and contagious sense of energy. So I'm delighted uh, that she's with us uh, this morning, and I look forward to her report. Dr. Albert. Chair Beeson, members of the board, and President Kaler, it is my intent to have the voice of equity and diversity grow stronger at the U of M. I'm especially delighted to be here today to share my insights that I've gleaned over my past seven months at the U and lead a discussion with you on a national conversation that we must give our undivided attention. I'm driven to excel to help the U of M claim victory on its most ambitious equity and diversity goals, especially those that are strategically aligned with the overall mission of the institution and President Kaler's plan to champion our university's impact and reputation. As this university's new leader focused on inclusion, I know how to operationalize the land grant mission. And my 12 years at LSU shows commitment to the long view and the process of diversity. All that I have done has prepared me for what is needed now, here, at this moment, at this institution. Based on years of hard work, in fall 2012, LSU enrolled its highest number of both African American and Latino students to date at the institution. African American student enrollment was 3,054. Latino student enrollment was at a high of 1,305. In addition to learning and discovery, two of the four strategic foci of the LSU National Flagship Agenda 2020 were diversity and engagement, two areas within my purview. One of my greatest achievements, given the regional challenges around marriage equality, was setting into motion the establishment of domestic partnership benefits for faculty and staff. These accomplishments demonstrate my deep experience in addressing issues related to equity and diversity across various identities, religion, ability, gender, sexual orientation, and race, just to name a few. Members of our community with these diverse identities continue to experience challenges. Also, many of us share multiple identities, which makes addressing these issues even more complicated. In spite of and because of these challenges, I'm excited to be here at the University of Minnesota. I've been engaged in my practice of strategic listening, giving individuals and, their, and communities the opportunity to voice their ideas and concerns on all five system campuses and in listening sessions with Twin Cities faculty and staff. Everything that I've heard in these conversations align with the priorities set forth in the university's equity and diversity vision framework. The trends and themes that have emerged are not unfamiliar to me. My colleagues here at the U are at other institutions, but I am here with new ideas about how we move forward together. Based upon these strategic listening opportunities, the highest needs and priorities that I will focus on in my first three years are recruiting and retaining underrepresented faculty and students, addressing issues of climate for diverse individuals and communities, and creating and enhancing strategic partnerships both within and outside of the university. 
In the past, the Office for Equity and Diversity has received guidance from this board regarding its work to facilitate the implementation of the university's vision framework. Today, I feel compelled to talk to you about a national issue facing all colleges and universities. This is not a new issue, but it is one that has a recurring cycle of urgency. The issues faced by African American students, especially black men, are at a fever pitch and de deserve our undivided attention. The national statistics are alarming. According to the National Center for Educational Statistics, or NESI, in 2012, black men comprised only 3.6% of student enrollment at institutions of higher education. This is almost a full percentage point less than this same statistic in 1976. Black men are overrepresented over on revenue generating intercollegiate sports teams. In 2009, they were only 3.6% of undergraduate students, but 55.3% of football and basketball players at public NC2A Division I institutions. Black male college completion rates are the lowest in higher education in the United States. Across four cohorts of undergraduates, the six-year graduation rate for black male students attending public colleges and universities was 33%, compared to 48% for students overall. The Race and College Success article that was included in your materials helps to further frame this national crisis of racial disparities in higher education. It takes the most empirical approach to examining the role that race plays in access, persistence, and graduation. This data unequivocally demonstrates that race needs to be carefully considered in every effort in enrolling, supporting, and graduating students of color. Looking at data that was originally <laughs> shared with you in December by Vice Provost and Dean of Undergraduate Education, Robert McMaster, the 2013 enrollment of black first year students on the Twin Cities campus is 3.9%. This number demonstrates the challenge we are all facing in regards to ensuring access for black students. Achieving representational diversity is one goal, but we also have to look at climate, which will imp impact student success and graduation. In the video we provided, you heard UCLA students address the crisis about their access and persistence to graduation at their predominantly white institution. At the University of Massachusetts, a petition is circulating that calls for changes in the way that campus police departments address race and crime reporting. While at San Jose State University, three students have been charged with a hate crime for more egregious acts of racial bullying. And the Being Black at Michigan hashtag began as a social media campaign and has grown into a larger student activist movement at the University of Michigan. What this means is that black students are bearing witness to the truths of the challenges they are facing on a very public stage. This is a national crisis. The media is watching, as are parents of prospective black students, and so are top flight faculty of color that we hope to recruit. I can't overemphasize how interconnected equity and diversity work is. Our efforts to recruit top flight students is connected to recruiting and retaining top flight faculty. Both of these Im impact how we engage the diverse communities from which we hire our staff and in whose neighborhoods we conduct our research. What we have heard is that our students have very similar concerns and experiences as their counterparts at UCLA, UMass, and Michigan. Data from our 2012 student experience at the Research University, or SERU survey, is very telling. In general, our students of color and students from under-resourced backgrounds report a lower sense of belonging on campus and a more hostile climate. One question I hope you will consider and give me your thoughts on is, how do we prepare for and address these cycles of urgency and harness the talents of those who are feeling the pain but yet still willing to be part of the solution? Much is being done, but there is more work to do. 
Simply put, these conversations are happening and scholars are exploring factors contributing to this crisis. The University of Minnesota is uniquely positioned to not only join the conversation as a thought leader, but also to become a national model for addressing racial disparities in access, enrollment, persistence, and graduation. In addition to what I have gleaned from the many conversations over the last seven months, two of the main things I have learned are, we must attend to these cycles of urgency and that this university is a university that understands the value of working in collaboration. Creating and sustaining a climate that is built upon a foundation of community and inclusive excellence remain paramount. The sense of urgency expressed by many about racial profiling has led us as a university to recognize that we need an institutional strategy. I'm very grateful to the president's office um, for being willing to support a focus on this topic at the highest levels. The newly formed Campus Climate Working Group will both engage senior leaders to identify and share information about and develop strategies to address campus climate generally and address specific campus climate issues that arise for members of our, of our community. As we do this work, it is essential that we work in partnership with those whose lives are most impacted. I want to highlight some of the efforts to address issues of access, academic achievement, and campus climate. Associate Vice Provost for Enrollment Management and Director of Admissions Rachel Hernandez has created the University Student of Color Executive Committee. This committee, which includes Vice Provost for Student Affairs and Dean of Students, Danita Brown Young, will review current efforts and practices around student of color recruitment and outreach and identify bold opportunities for collaboration in the efforts on campus-wide. We continue to draw attention to our points of pride. The Huntley House for African American Males is not only is the, I'm sorry, is the only African-American male leadership initiative in the country to include a residential component, along with other activities that other male leadership initiatives across the country have. Academic achievement, campus life and civic engagement, leadership development opportunities, and ethnic identity and gender role exploration. Drawing on the work of Dr. Sean Harper that we shared with you, we want to reframe the discussion about black male achievement here at the U of M. The Multicultural Center for Academic Excellence is uniquely situated to offer culturally responsive academic support and resources for both personal and professional development. These efforts, like so many of our most impactful strategies, have been vi driven by the vision framework and have come out of meetings that OED has had with the deans and the chancellors. This month, we will again embark upon meeting with each of the deans to learn about ways that we can support them in achieving their mission-driven strategic equity and diversity goals. Lastly, we have plans to hear from students themselves. I will host a student listening session in March. As in the past, we have had the opportunity to hear from the board and look forward to our discussion today to inform this very important upcoming conversation. I can assure you, some of these ongoing strategies and investments and some of these brand new bold ideas are works in progress. We will not claim victory on this overnight, but we must assure our constituents that we're working hard. We must assure our partners that we are in the, this wheelhouse together. And I must assure you that I am in this for the long haul, for it is a long-term and strategic process that requires commitment and patience. Another question I hope you will consider is, what are your thoughts about what it takes for university communities to remain engaged in long-term strategies? Chair Beeson, members of the board, and President Kaler, thank you so much for your time about this important discussion, and I look forward to getting your feedback in the time we have left together. Thank you, Vice President Almert. We appreciate this critical, uh, your critical message 
and look forward to working with you in the year to come. And I will open um, this important topic up to the board for discussion. Regent Larson. Thanks very much uh, for your report and your obvious uh, enthusiasm and dedication. One of the biggest challenges and opportunities that we have as a society is to get more males, up, and particularly males of color, educated and productive in our society as leaders and mentors. It's a great big challenge, but do a lot of good for not only those people, males of color, but also for our entire society. So good luck. We're with you all the way. Thank you. Regent Simmons. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for setting the stage for what you're going to do and what we, we need to and want to do with you. Have you been here long enough to identify some good things that are happening that are potentially diffusable across the system? Chair, President B Albert. Chair Beeson, uh, Regent Simmons, members of the board, President Kaler. Um, yes, I have. And, and that was part of the, the draw to the University of Minnesota from my home state of uh, Louisiana. And, um, there are, there are so many opportunities here at the U across the entire system. Um, during my strategic listening sessions, um, many people gave me not only bold ideas, but talked about their successes. Um, the U of M has such a long history and a long legacy related to equity and diversity goals. Um, institutions that are um, in the SEC are you, are, you are light years ahead in terms of just the years of commitment. We are celebrating 20 years of um, our LGBT a programs office, 20 years of the Puckett Scholarship, uh, 20 years of our Office of Conflict Resolution. So we have a very long legacy. Um, during these strategic listening sessions across the system, we heard many compliments about uh, the, the cross collabor collaborative work, the interdisciplinary work, faculty who are committed to research in terms of diverse communities, and really and truly the you setting the pace and taking the leadership role in generation, generation Next to try and close the achievement and opportunity gap. So I will say this was really a part of the reason which drew me from a subtropic culture to the pool of vortex. <laughs> to be engaged in, in work that where there have been many successes, but work is still yet to be done. And Vice President Albert, although you've encountered the polar vortex, you do, as a St. Paulite, you have a warm place to live. That's right. So. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good choice. Um, Regent Omari. Uh, thank you, Chair Beeson. Uh, thank you, Dr. Albert. Uh, this is exciting. Um, we have some grand challenges, but I appreciate uh, Dr. Kaler's commitment to uh, increasing black males on campus. One of the first conversations we had was about this. Um, you know, I, I think we have a lot of opportunities with hometown talent, actually, um, because we have a lot of it. And when I was running for the board, I talked about my first memorable experience on campus being at freshman orientation. And so that's a, that's a recruiting question. I think we have some, some opportunity there, so I'm excited for that. And then, of course, we have some opportunities around inclusion. Uh, I also think at one of my first board meetings, I talked about Vince, uh, Vincent Tinto, and everybody teased me because of that. But um, we have some opportunities for inclusion uh, as well. And we see some students here, and this is a sign of how important this matter is. Uh, and, and it is a national crisis, it's not just here. Um, but we, we, we're going to focus on home. And the last thing I'll say is not good luck, but uh, let's do it because this is something for all of us to do, and it's not something that the Office for Equity and Diversity should focus on and be over there. We talk about interdisciplinary 
uh, work and, and working together. It's not just their job, it's our institution's job, it's the citizens of our state to uh, educate our people. And, and uh, so, let's do it. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Larson. Or, excuse me, uh, Regent Allen. No, I'm fine, I, my Mark. question was. Mr. Chairman. Regent Johnson, yes. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Dr. Albers, for your work and your uh, tenure here. Uh, a question, um, it's always interesting when a new person comes on board on staff, faculty, into a business. What are your first kind of inklings and impressions of the University of Minnesota as a girl in regard to race and culture? And second of all, what are the maybe one or two most pressing immediate issues? We can look long term, but we have to address the immediacy, okay? So impressions and one or two problems that you see that are most glaring, please. Chair Beeson, Regent Johnson, members of the board, President Kaler. Um, over the seven months, I have been able to glean lots of information about the University of Minnesota. What, what I know is that people want to bring their very best selves to the institution. They want to bring their very best selves every day and to solve some of these social ills. So every conversation that I have been in, I have gotten um, not only recommendations, but people's commitment to be a part of this long view process. Um, I think that uh, a lot of community members are very anxious. So I have to remind them that I'm only seven months in <laughs> and that these types of challenges will not be solved overnight. Um, uh, OED has a vision framework and I think that that was um, a reason that draw, drew me here, that they had done the work in terms of thinking about priorities. I think that a pressing concern is to get to work. So to start implementing those priorities and those strategies. I think another pressing concern is something that I mentioned in the, in the talk, the, the issue around, around climate for some of our diverse communities. We are having conversations, not only at the highest level, but those whose lives are impacted. Um, issues re related to race on campus, uh, not only is happening at UCLA and um, San Jose State and UMass, there those conversations are happening right here at the U. So, you know, while the larger campus community, including these diverse communities, are very concerned around campus safety, issues related to potentially being looked at in a very different way because you fit the racial descriptor in a in a crime alert is is very hard for students and for staff and for faculty to manage. And so I think addressing, being able to work with those whose lives are impacted the most to find strategic ways in which to move this university forward will be a, a very um, current issue for me. Mr. Chairman, just follow up. Regent uh, Johnson, yes. Mr. Chairman, um, Dr. Albers, do you in your short time believe and the uh, feedback you have gained that the admissions process for students of color is fair, equitable, just, all of those words? Regent Beeson, Chair Beeson, I'm sorry, Regent Johnson, members of the board, President Kaler, um, that is exactly the reason why I've been in conversations with um, Vice Provost McMaster and um, Assistant Vice Provost uh, Rachel Hernandez. We have to think about bold ideas around the way in which we recruit and encourage students of color to see the University of Minnesota as their top college choice. Um, I think that uh, Vice Provost McMaster would agree with me. We are missing out on a segment of students of color who qualify for the U, who apply to the U, and then choose another university. So that is a major pool that we have to really focus our attention on in terms of figuring out the reasons why they are not selecting our institution as their co top college choice. So will we be talking about other ideas around recruitment, especially as Regional Amari suggested, um, homegrown talent, but also looking nationwide to bring the best and brightest students of color to the University of Minnesota. Thank you. 
Other comments? I was going to ask Dr. Albert, the, we, we're, um, the work is, is the institution is doing on the achievement gap, and Dr. Kaler is involved at, at, at one level, and our School of Education is involved in brain development research issues, but um, you'll be playing a bridge role those conversations between the community and, and the university, and what if you had specific opinions about how how we can accelerate those those conversations? Chair Beast and members of the board, President Kaler, yes, and I think that that's critical to the third uh, component of the top priorities around our commitment to strategic partnerships, both within the university and outside of the university. Uh, I have been well steeped in in terms of the opportunity and the achievement gap, and the university being on first base with trying to figure out uh, these issues. And so our office is working in concentration with uh, the College of Education and human development with organizations outside of the institution like the African American Leadership Forum and uh, members of the Lynx Incorporated. So th those are just some organizations that see this as a major, um, a major priority for us. I think that we have, um, we have a lot of opportunity um, with these strategic partnerships and I look forward to working with all of the um, entities both inside and outside of the university. University. Thank you. Regent Cohen. Thank you, Chair Beeson, and uh, thank you, Dr. Albert, uh, very much, and thank you for coming from warm weather to, <laughs> <laughs> to this area and all the expertise and, and experience that you bring. really sounds helpful. I don't want to put you on the spot. I know you've only been here seven months. Mm -hmm. However, you've talked a lot about conversations and the working groups and executive committee that you're creating. Uh, do you have a couple of the bold ideas that maybe are in your head that you could share with the board? <laughs> um, yes, I do. Um, uh, Chair, Chair Beeson, Regent Cohen, members of the board, President Kaler, yes, I do have lots of bold ideas, and I think that the, the partnerships are part of that. Um, you know, anytime you come to a new place, you have got to be able to um, integrate into the community. You can't come with bold ideas from outside of the institution to say this is going to work here. But those strategic partnerships, I'm able to make these sorts of suggestions. So, for instance, we are working in concert with the Office of Admissions to do a pilot program in the spring for um, high-achieving um, ethnic minority students who are juniors in high school to bring them to campus for a weekend to demystify college right and then to also demonstrate all of the academic achievement leadership opportunities that they can have at the U if if this is the, their top college choice. We will track that those students and we'll track that cohort and co to continue to engage um, them during their senior year in hopes of really being able to attract them. Uh, this is a, it's a pilot program that I used at LSU and that program became the highest yielding program to get to the numbers that I talked about. So we actually really need to start uh, introducing college much earlier, but the junior year is when they're over 16 and parents are willing to allow their 16-year-olds to stay with us over the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. This has been an exciting and important, uh, and we look forward to working with you, Dr. Alberts, on this um, over the next number of years. Thank you so much. Thanks. I appreciate your Thanks time. Thanks very, very much. Next item is a uh, is a uh, are some changes that we're going to consider to the bylaws for two committees created by the board to provide assistance and advice on matters related to the <coughs> oversight of Eastcliff. And Regent Simmons, uh, this falls into the categories other duties assigned. Has been working um, diligently with our stakeholders and with our friends uh, in this really important and historic place. Uh, called Eastcliff. Regent Simmons currently serves as chair of the Friends of Eastcliff Committee. So, uh, Regent Simmons, would you please introduce some proposed changes and then offer a motion? I will. Thank you, Chair Beeson. First of all, we've moved from one of the most profoundly important topics in this country 
this state and therefore this university to talking about a house. Uh, let's don't spend too long on the house, a house. Um, the intent of the bylaw changes you see before you are to really redefine authority, responsibility, and people these two committees with folks who can carry the, those uh, responsibilities out. So that is all we're trying to do here. Um, we have this historic uh, two bodies created a few decades ago that have organically grown, and now we're taking a look at them and saying, here's what we really need, here's what we need to people them. So you, the, the bylaws changed, rename the Friends of East Cliff to, the, to, dis, to a more descriptive and accurate name, and that is the East Cliff um, Advisory Board. This is analogous to other advisory boards in the university with internal and external people. Makes it a rich group, uh, engages more people in the life of the university. And then the East Cliff Technical uh, Committee is peopled with the people who have the technical expertise uh, within the university to help manage a house. Um, there are thresholds set for approvals, and so with those comments, I would like to move approval to these bylaws changes. There is a motion. Is there a second to the motion? Regent second. Rod? Is that a second today? Yes, sir. Good. Is there any discussion by the board? If I should point out, this Regent had Simmons. broad input from the people engaged and who care and who've been wonderful in serving in these roles, and they are supportive. Thank you. I'll call for the vote then. Will all those in favor of this motion, please say aye. 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 And those opposed, motion passes. Thank you. Thanks again, Regent Simmons. Pleasure. Now we turn our attention to the Board of Regent Policy on student representatives to the board. The students who fill these roles help us fulfill our governor's responsibilities by providing advice and guidance from the student perspective. The proposed amendments to the student representative policy seek to ensure that each student representative understands his or her role is prepared to effectively present the student voice to the Board of Regents. The proposed changes are as follows. Number one, establish selection criteria and desired attributes along with a clear set of duties for the position. Number two, alignment, aligning the one-year term of the student representatives with the Board's meeting calendar. Number three, setting expectations for attendance and time commitment, clarifying practices concerning absences, variances, removals. Fourth, elimination of the position of alternative student representative. And finally, removal of outdated language and improvement of overall readability of the policy. Again, this is a policy not unlike Eastcliff that um, was um, correctly written uh, at, uh, for its purpose, but over time uh, it has uh, Time has progressed and the need for updating is apparent. Vice President, uh, excuse me, Vice Provost Danita Brown Young and Student Rep Chair Megan Mason have provided very helpful input during the policy review process, work closely with the board office on this matter. So this policy is before us today and uh, will return to us in March for action. Is there any discussion about the proposed amendments this morning? Regent Omari. Uh, thank you, Chair Beeson. Just a quick comment. Um, I also um, had a chance to, to give some input, and I know that the board is still interacting with the student reps. Uh, the board office is still interacting with them, and so I'm hopeful that between some different uh, entities, including uh, uh, Dr. Danita Brown Young, um, this will be passed without any. Uh, difficult in the March meeting and all voices will be heard. So I know some conversations are still happening. Thank you for that. Thank you, Regent Omari. That comment will be duly noted. Is there any further discussion on this, this item? Thank you. We'll move on then. Next, we'll consider a resolution authorizing President Kaler to enter into a branding agreement between the University of Minnesota and the integrated structure. President Kaler, would you uh, start off this conversation? Regent Beeson, would you like for me to recuse? Uh, I would say yes, if, sure. if you would, please. Thank you, Regent Simmons. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm pleased and excited to introduce this next group of university leaders uh, who have worked uh, tirelessly uh, to bring us to a very important uh, point. Uh, they will present to you the finishing touches on an inter integrated structure agreement between the University, University of Minnesota Physicians, and Fairview Health Services. Uh, this new brand that you will see uh, uniquely uh, identifies what we bring to patient care in Minnesota, which is cutting edge academic medicine. Our goals are to provide exceptional patient care, to increase support for our medical school, to ensure we meet the workforce challenges of Minnesota in the nation's changing landscape. Uh, it's been one of my priorities, and I'm very pleased uh, that you will see uh, soon uh, an important step forward. I'm delighted uh, that our partner, uh, Roland Stacy, uh, has been uh, with us uh, all the way in this transition, and I believe Roland was planning to be here. Would you please stand up? Thank you. Good morning. He is uh, the new president and CEO of Fairview, as you know, and I look forward to working closely uh, with him uh, in the coming years uh, to move this uh, great partnership uh, to even greater heights. Uh, as we welcome Dr. Stacy, we must uh, give uh, great thanks and uh, wish Godspeed to uh, Dr. Aaron Friedman. Uh, it is uh, completely fitting uh, that on Valentine's Day <laughs> and Dr. Friedman's last day as the Dean of the Medical School and Vice President for Health Sciences uh, that we're actually completing uh, this very important uh, transition. Aaron, we literally would not have gotten here without you. Uh, I'm so grateful for all you've done and particularly view this as, uh, as a crowning achievement. So congratulations to you uh, and welcome uh, and thank you uh, to the rest of the team. Thank you. Congrats. Good morning, presenters. Uh, Chair Beeson, President Kaler, and members of the Board of Regents. We're delighted to be here today to present the conclusion of significant amount of work to replace the integrated structure name with something that's more meaningful. <laughs> Uh, the principles that we applied to this process were that we wanted to support the overall strategy for the integrated structure, uh, which was to provide exceptional care and leverage the assets of the university. Therefore, the brand equity of the University of Minnesota and its reputation uh, needed to uh, be leveraged. Uh, we desire to reflect what differentiates the IS in the marketplace, and we wanted to ensure that the name was short, memorable and applicable across multiple formats. So on this slide, uh, you see the, the depiction of University of Minnesota Health, uh, which is the name that we will begin to apply to the integrated structure. Um, on the left, uh, you see a transition brand with University of Minnesota Under Health. Uh, to the right, you see M and Health utilizing the block M and Health, and we hope that that ultimately is the end brand. Uh, beneath that, you can see how various core facilities might be named uh, utilizing the block M and Health with University of Minnesota Medical Center and, and other potential building sites. And uh, on, on the bottom, you can see how University of Minnesota service lines uh, utilizing the University of Minnesota Health uh, logo will be, uh, will be applied. To validate the University of Minnesota Health name, we conducted extensive research. We tested several potential names with consumers and referring physicians. We vetted them with leadership of all three of our organizations, the University, UMP, and Fairview. We found that co uh, consumers prefer the University of Minnesota spelled out but consumers also understand that the block M represents the full name. And the word health evoked images and associations which best reflect the vision of the integrated structure. We also considered how our, competitor, our competitors and peers position themselves in the marketplace. More and could, by the way, could all the presenters for the record just identify themselves? Sure, Diana Harvey, Chief Communications Officer for the University of Minnesota. Carolyn Wilson, University of Minnesota Medical Center President. Bobby Daniels, CEO of University of Minnesota Physicians and Vice Dean of the Medical School for Clinical Affairs. Thank you. And Aaron Friedman, the outgoing VP and Dean. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, more important than the name itself are the parameters within which the University of Minnesota name and its related assets, such as the Block M, can be used. 
On the advice of legal counsel, we developed a branding agreement that governs the use of the university name by the integrated structure. The key terms of that branding agreement include compliance with existing policies that govern the use of the University of Minnesota name, medical <coughs> leadership by university faculty wherever the name is used and services provided by, arranged for, or <coughs> managed by UM physicians. In addition, services operating under the University of Minnesota Health must be governed by quality standards established by University of Minnesota physicians. Furthermore, approval for the use of the name to identify a physical location may be done only with the prior approval of the IS co-presidents, uh, the UM physician CEO, the dean of the medical school, and the head of the Office of University Relations. Uh, it is required that University Relations actively participate in the development and execution of the external facing brand. And finally, the term of the branding agreement is the same as the master IS agreement. Dr. Friedman. Yes, uh, I just uh, wanted to make sure that there wasn't something in between. The <clears throat> so our next steps are to uh, roll this out to our internal audiences, and we're uh, geared to do that. Uh, we will alter building signage. We will launch into the marketplace with a highly visible campaign spanning a variety of media channels. And I think uh, this last point is interesting because it's fully expected by the competitors in the marketplace. So uh, I, I do want to make one last comment, and that is uh, uh, President Kaler mentioned uh, the work involved in putting all this together. Uh, and it has been uh, not just a three-year cycle, my period of time, but frankly a 17-year cycle uh, in uh, trying and getting from the original uh, affiliation arrangement to, to this point in time. Uh, but we would not have gotten there with a considerable effort on the part of the university, on the part of Bobby and Carolyn and others, and uh, also just tremendous work uh, by uh, legal team and, and uh, others within all three organizations. So. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Friedman. I was going to ask Regent Frobenius and Regent Allens to maybe make a few comments on this. They've been lead uh, people um, in connection with the Academic Health Center and the many issues that have come before the board. If they could spend a minute or so and um, weigh in on this uh, important consideration. Uh, I, I like the uh, proposal. Uh, when I first started to read the, about the agreement, I, it, we weren't looking at one particular symbol, and my first question was, well, how many different options can we look at here? Is that uh, too many? And as I read the agreement, uh, the combinations we'll look at are limited by the, the elements you have to work with. Uh, so I felt comfortable with that, and I particularly like the uh, samples of that you've shown today. So I'm all in favor of this change. I also point out how important it is because in our uh, surveys among the uh, population of how they feel about the university, one of the strong points that comes across is uh, particularly the Amplatz Hospital, and, and that means to me all of the medical uh, is important to the people of the state. So. Uh, it's an important issue. I've read it. I'm very comfortable with it. I think it's excellent work. Thank you, Regent Allen. Regent Fabians. Well, I too am pleased that we are at this point after a rather extended period of time. In my head, this really goes back to even before the mid 1990s. But in the mid 1990s, as many major teaching centers across the country, the U of M Medical Center was in serious financial difficulties, and its future and its mission were in doubt. Uh, at the time, Fairview stepped to the challenge and did acquire the Medical Center Hospital, when others might have wanted to do some different things with it. And uh, Fairview accepted the challenge and the partnership and the inclusion of the academic mission in its, at that time. Working together, the two organizations with Fairview's leadership were able to stabilize the financial issues and restore the viability of the University Hospital. And that's important. Uh, time has again shifted in the sands of health care, and our relationship has to evolve. Uh, the integrated structure strengthens that relationship significantly between the U of M Physician Practice Group, the U and Fairview. And hopefully all of us will remain true to our missions and our collective mission in the challenging times ahead. As we organize this Minnesota-based enterprise, and I think this is an important point for us to remember, for all parties to remember at this point, the U of M is delegating its most valuable asset 
to the shared enterprise, our name and our reputation. Our staff has worked hard in this process to assure that the quality control and academic mission are at the core of this new structure, along with outstanding and cost-effective patient care. Um, doing so in a very, very competitive marketplace. There is no part of our mission that we more va highly value than our commitment to provide the next generation of medical practitioners, as well as the transition of new clinical knowledge into practice. We believe that Fairview also shares that value, and we urge Fairview leaders to accept that challenge and mission as the highest principle and guiding light as we work together in this important endeavor and to take good care of our name. I support the recommendation. Thank you, Regent Fabinius. Regent Devine. Thank you for the presentation, and I want to thank all the people that have been involved in the extensive work that's gone on, and I can certainly appreciate the seven years of effort that's gone on prior to all this to bring this to us here the, this morning. I, I just want to comment on the fact that I, this is a very, very important step in broadening the brand awareness of the university and what we're doing here in our mission, both clinical teaching and the research aspects of it. And as we move forward here, it's you know, with the increased expanding competition that's coming about here right now, this brand identity I think is going to be very important in establishing us further in the minds of many people and particularly here the community in the state of Minnesota. And I also look at the branding as it relates to what's going to happen in the future here. Right now, this past uh, six months, we've been dealing with the mechanics of financing health care on a national level and at a state level, but it's really going to be driven in what's going to happen in the change of delivery of health care of ACA going forward. And our brand identity and our brand establishment is going to be particularly important here going forward. And to have a common vision of what this branding is going to look like, I think, is paramount right now to establishing the University of Minnesota as our flagship here in Minnesota in health care. And so going forward here, this identity is important, and I, I thank you all for the effort, and I hope that we have a, a wonderful campaign to strengthen that and the relationship as it expands with what we're doing with our partners in all aspects, both physical and then delivery. Yeah, this brand uh, resonates all of what is good about what we do here in our mission at the University of Minnesota. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Devine. Regent Cohen. Thanks, Chair Beeson. Uh, first of all, I want to commend you all on the very, very hard work that I know that this has taken to get to this point. And to me, it represents really a, a stronger uh, affiliation between our par the partner, Fairview, and the University of Minnesota. So I am very much in the favor, favor of it. Uh, Regent Allen <coughs> did refer to that we, we know from some engagement surveys and so on how important the name of University of Minnesota. And so I'm not a marketing person, but when I see these two uh, <coughs> insignias up here, I question whether we really want to drop that University of Minnesota part of it because I do think people see the block M as University of Minnesota, but having that name, University of Minnesota, in a health system, I think is awfully important. So that's up for you all to decide. <laughs> Regent Larson. <clears throat> Thank you for all your good work. Um, I do have a question. It appears to me, and this is an appearance, it's not necessarily a fact, but it appears to me that we didn't really manage our brand in our uh, relationship with Fairview in the past. And I just want to encourage you to make sure that whatever we do now, that we put absolute controls in place and have absolute agreement with Fairview, they're not going to deviate from whatever it is we decide upon, whether it's Regent Cohn's recommendation or the lower one, but whatever it is that we decide on, they can't tamper with that at all. Um, and that we have to have controls in place to make sure that that is the case because it is our brand, and we're not giving it away. Regent Broad. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And actually, as a follow-up to Regent Larson, I think I think you're spot on on that. But brand, brand creation is so important, and brand utilization is as well. And so I think about the land of acronyms that we live in, and I hope that we're disciplined enough, to use Vice President Herman's word, disciplined enough to not fall into UMH or something along those lines, because I think that word obviously was very carefully chosen and very carefully thought out, and I think we should utilize that brand appropriately. Any comments back from the presenters? Um, you're in agreement with those if statements? I could, uh, Dr. Regent Beeson, if I could make one comment. Uh, if we go around the country and ask the same question, just to uh, your comment, Regent Broad, uh, almost nobody has slipped into the acronym uh, because of the power of not only the brand, the university's brand, wherever you are, whether it's Washington or Wisconsin or uh, Missouri, uh, but also the power of the word health. Okay, we are then uh, looking for a motion if there's no further discussion. So uh, move. Through the res second. On this matter, there's a motion and Regent Fabinius is second of that. Is there any final discussion on, uh, on this consideration? Not hearing any, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Regent symbols will be noted as uh, having abstained. Motion passes. Thank you very, very much. Good job, presenters. Receive a report on the two year pilot program on alcohol sales at TCF Bank Stadium. Vice President Wheelock, Vice Provost Brown Young, and Mr. McGinnis will provide us with their report. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the board. As you indicated, Mr. Chair, we are here today at the conclusion after this last football season of the two-year pilot at TCF Stadium relative to the sale of uh, beer and wine in the general seating area at TCF and, and other parts of the premium area in the building. Um, we really have had a long history, and on page 74 of the docket materials, we start with a more detailed report. But we've had a long history at the institution uh, once we uh, made the decision and found the resources to build a, a stadium on campus again about our plans, our expectations, and our interests relative to the use and consumption and the sale of alcohol at TCF Stadium. Uh, we really refer back to the Board of Regents policy, which has guided our thinking operationally on this issue, and obviously the Board of Regents has expressed an intent that the institution will comply with all applicable state, federal, local uh, laws regarding the use, possession, distribution, consumption, and sale of alcoholic beverages on campus. Furthermore, the university also expects compliance from uh, not only our employees, but our students and campus visitors with respect to these laws. We've emphasized education and counseling. The university is committed to offering and promoting counseling, education, and prevention programs and activities related to personal responsibility and moderation in alcohol consumption, the association between excessive alcohol consumption and high-risk behavior, the benefits of abstinence, and the prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of alcohol misuse and abuse. And finally, uh, the university is committed to promoting a healthy and safe living and learning environment for its employees, students, and visitors. So how has that translated into uh, the implementation at TCF Stadium? Well, we've certainly emphasized that we want to have a safe and fan-friendly atmosphere. As we've conducted the two-year pilot, we've also wanted to respect the donor commitments related to the Tribal Nations Plaza and Veterans Memorial on the west end of the TCF Stadium. And we want to have an appropriate and controlled game day environment. Uh, obviously, we, as we indicated, we want to have compliance with applicable laws, and we also want to be consistent with legislative intent. 
We've fashioned this so that we can appropriately serve alcohol to the five to 7,000 uh, general seating fans on average each game that have an interest and to locate the alcohol sales points of service to take into consideration uh, the proximity to the student seating area and also with any kind of concerns or interest relative to access for food service and restrooms and also with respect to the number of fans that we think need to be served at each of the games. So the two-year pilot, um, excuse me, let me go back just one more. So the current proced procedure, I won't go through these one by one, but suffice it to say that we have taken into account the way that we're going to manage our operations so that we limit not only the individual uh, at the point of sale to an, uh, a limited number of uh, beers that can be bought at any one time, the number of uh, minutes during the course of the event or the duration of the event during which we will sell it and the locations where it can be uh, sold within the building. We also obviously have emphasized that you must demonstrate that you are of legal age before you can consume. We've trained our um, sales staff on appropriate uh, behavior relative to monitoring and complying with laws and also identifying if there are issues relative to consumption. And we've uh, also put in place programs for a designated driver program, uh, appropriately staffed our building and reminded people of, uh, during the course of the play about appropriate behavior and consumption. So where did that get us after our two years? What did we learn? What did we find? Well, we want to talk a little bit with you about our public safety and neighborhood impacts, um, as well our student uh, experience and alcohol use, how this has affected fan experience, and what the financial consequences have been for the institution. So from a public safety impact, actually during the five uh, seasons that we have had football back on the uh, campus, during the years where we have actually permitted alcohol sale, we have seen no meaningful increase in any uh, alcohol-related incidences at our TCF stadium for Gopher football games. Um, in addition to that, you can see the numbers here, but in addition to that, we have also not seen an increase in any of the surrounding neighborhoods on game day. And perhaps because the more people there are, uh, frankly, the safer the environment that that creates. There are more eyes on the street. So we have neither seen an, a reason to uh, not continue this practice because of game day experiences in the building or frankly the game day experiences outside of the building. And I'll turn it over to my colleague, Danita Young, uh, Brown Young, for further comment on alcohol use and student interests. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the board, and President Kaler. Our students and fans have responded positively to this pilot and have generally met this added benefit with respect and with responsibility. It proves what we have expected, that Gopher fans know how to have fun and can be good neighbors. Boynton Health Service conducts the College Student Health Survey every three years. Overall, our students report less risky alcohol use from 2007 to 2013. Since 2007, students 18 to 24 years old have consistently reported reductions in any alcohol use over the past 30 days and a reduction in high-risk drinking from 41.6% down to 35.2%. As well, students have reported fewer negative consequences due to excessive alcohol use, such as having a hangover, getting into an argument or a fight, missing class, or doing something that they have regretted. These all have decreased since 2010. As Vice President Wheelock mentioned earlier, the university is committed to offering and promoting counseling, education, and prevention programs and activities to deal with alcohol use and prevention. Increasing efforts in other areas such as enforcement, policy review, and further assessment are all needed to reduce any impact of the additional availability may cause. We believe that we have put into place reasonable measures at the TCF Bank Stadium to limit alcohol consumption by students who are underage and believe that when coupled with our ongoing educational and intervention efforts, that continued sales of beer and wine in the general seating area will not be detrimental to student development nor encourage more binge or excessive drinking. 
Uh, Chair Beeson, members of the board, President Kaler, thank you for your time this morning. I uh, just want to review with you some of the financial numbers and the impact we've had in the first two years of the program. Um, as you can see, our gross sales in 2012 uh, exceeded just over $900,000, uh, which gave us just over $200,000 in commissions. Uh, our profits in year one weren't overly high, but I think that was a result of, with any new venture, there's a number of startup costs. Uh, so we incurred a number of those costs in year one of the program. Um, as we transitioned in year two, we were more comfortable with those uh, and continued to work towards, one, um, reducing some of those expenses and costs associated with the program, as well as we've been able to partner with Airmark uh, and redefine our commission structure, which enabled us to recognize greater level of profits from the sale um, of the alcohol um, in, years one, in year two. Uh, and look forward into hopefully the opportunity to move forward and continue to run a more efficient operation, which enables us to generate additional revenues for our department. So where does that leave us? Well, it leaves us in a position where university is recommending and intends to continue with the sale of beer and alcohol or beer and wine on, on football game days in premium areas and in the seating bowl in the stadium. The only significant change uh, that we're making is to increase the points of sale to accommodate our fan experience and convenience and also in recognition that the uh, beer garden on the west end of the stadium uh, will be reduced in size because of the temporary bleachers that will be in place for to support the Vikings game. So we will increase the points of sale in the building to improve fan experience but with a mindfulness still about the proximity to the student seating. This makes for a very simple legislative change where we really are only recommending to the legislature the removal of the language that is specifically about the two-year program and the sunset, uh, but with an ad advisement that we are not recommending and do not support an expansion of the sale of beer and alcohol at any of our other uh, sports facilities, specifically Mariucci and Williams Arena. And a couple of additional comments to uh, elaborate on that. Uh, we believe that because of the way that those complexes are designed and the proximity of the fans to the sporting event, it does not enhance either our expectations about conduct during the course of the event. It will not enhance the student athlete experience uh, as evidence has provided from other venues where we have explored that. And frankly, those facilities are not laid out in such a way that we can accommodate any increase in sales in the concourse areas without some concern about public safety should there be an event that could occur or fan comfort and experience in moving through the concourse areas if we were to increase congestion with additional sales. So we are not supporting an expansion, but do support the continued continuation in TCF Stadium consistent with our two-year experience. With that, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. President, and Regents, we're available for any questions. Thank you, presenters. I'll remind uh, colleagues this report is uh, for information and we, this is an administrative matter, um, but we will open up for questions. Regent Simmons. I would just comment that when we have deliberated on policies uh, about alcohol uh, sales and availability in the stadia before, we've emphasized that a goal is not um, maximizing profits from direct sales of alcohol. It is providing um, and a level, an appropriate level of entertainment uh, and meeting expectations that particularly have to do with our premium seating and suites. So I just want to be careful we don't move to looking at how do we maximize the direct sales profitability. That is not a goal and should not ever be a goal. Regent Johnson. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, a little bit on the, uh, as we come to the conclusion of our board meeting, lighter side of the house and uh, please understand me. Um, the folks that I live with and integrate with uh, West Central Minnesota, they oftentimes ask me five questions about being a member of the Board of Regents. Generally, you know what it's like and how do I get along with my colleagues. But here's the order of questions that I usually get. How do I gain access or uh, admission of my son or daughter or grand child to the University of Minnesota? That's the most often asked question. Number two, an appreciation for the medical facilities that we have. 
Number three, what's President Kaler like? <laughs> Number four. How do you answer that? How long does it take you to answer? I will not, uh, we're on public record. I will not, uh, no. I always say very good things, uh, President Kaler. Number four, uh, usually some discussion about athletic update. And fifthly, how can the university sell beer and lose money? Have, I have been asked that question so many times, and now I'm happy to report that the university, in all deference to you, Dr. Simmons, this is not a profit motive, but please don't sell beer and lose money. And they have offered to come down here, bring kegs of beer, cases of beer, whatever, but for the record, we're making money. We're not losing money, okay? So just put a smile on your face, and uh, that's what folks out west talk about in regard to the university. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Regent Johnson. Regent Lucas. Thank you, Chair Beeson. Um, for 10 years, I chaired the concessions committee at the Metrodome, and I know how robust those Vikings per caps are, and I'm wondering uh, what you anticipate in terms of uh, comparison to Gopher fans. How, what are you anticipating from Viking fans for this kind of volume sales? Well, I'll, I'll make some introductory comment and then see if my colleague on the other side of the table wants to add anything. Um, the, the first thing I would say is that uh, there will be fewer people in the TCF just because of the c capacity than when it's full than there will be at the Metrodome. Secondly, there will not be any sale of hard liquor at TCF Stadium, which is a difference from the Metrodome as well. And the third is um, it will be um, determined in part by points of sale and convenience, and so we're still working through some of those operational issues. And the fourth is beyond that, I really don't know. Tom? Um, Would you identify yourself? Absolutely. Um, Tom McGinnis, uh, uh, Regent Lucas, Chair Beeson, uh, members of the board. Um, you know, I believe it'll be a learning experience for us. I mean, obviously, it's a slightly different clientele uh, that we'll have at their games versus ours. Uh, you won't have a student component um, as well, so it'll be, a, a, again, a different um, clientele. So it'll be a learning experience for us. Um, you know, I think we've got a good plan in place. We're partnering with the Vikings on all operations of what Viking game days will look like in TCF Bank Stadium. So, um, you know, I think it's going to be a unique opportunity for us. But I think using, utilizing their expertise uh, on running their football games along with our expertise for our venue will definitely make sure it's a positive impact. Thank you. Regent Devine. Thank you, uh, Chairman Beeson. Um, I was enlightened to see on, on uh, slide seven there about the decline of alcohol use amongst our students. But I'm also quickly reminded that trends on alcohol use typically in college campuses go up and down across the country. And I think there's been always, always been a long history of that. With that, um, obviously our increased efforts that we've done here, and when we talked about this initially on the initial approvals, there was a lot of discussion in and around the educational aspects of what were going on. And I'd like to just also point out continually every year we have a fourth of our students that are graduating on time in four years. And then we also have 25% uh, of our student bodies brand new every year. And my, I guess my question uh, that we've discussed before, but I would like to reiterate and get another affirmation today is, do we have continued efforts both to continue our alcohol education issues, both you know, in orientation, welcome week, freshman, blah, blah, all the way through uh, for our students that are underage? Regent um, Beeson, Chairman Beeson, uh, members of the board, and Regent Devine. Yes, absolutely. The education really starts with the recruiting process, so that we are telling our prospective students what our expectations are um, for them to be a gopher, um, and then telling them about the educational laws, the policies, the underage drinking uh, consequences. We have alcohol EDU which is an initiative that started to really educate and tell students about uh, binge drinking, risky behaviors associated with that. We have student health advocates that go out and speak to their peers about alcohol and other uh, health-related issues. We have 
point of contact with our student code, uh, student conduct and academic, academic integrity office, members of student affairs that meet with uh, students to talk about um, if they do encounter uh, a consequence where they are a violation of the, our alcohol policy, they do meet with us uh, directly and then we also educate them about their choices and we kind of monitor them, um, but we do offer counseling, um, support groups and, and whatnot. So we do have that continued education process. Very good, I'm glad it enlightens me to know that we're continuing on those aggressive efforts because that's important here as part of this. And it's an ongoing issue, obviously, with the turn of the student population. Thank you. Thank you. Regent Broad. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I, I guess I, I'm um, glad that we're moving forward in a stable policy um, and looking at getting rid of that sunset. Um, I, I think it's important to not any longer spend one more ounce of political capital on this issue at the Capitol. So my question really is, um, you know, I, I'm assuming that this removal of the sunset really will be something that is uh, uh, welcomed uh, by legislators, but do you have any sense of the opinions around that from our friends uh, in St. Paul? Mr. Chair, Regent Broad, I, I know that Jason Roloff at IGR has been engaged in discussions and the President has some knowledge of their reaction to that as well. President Kaler. Uh, Chair Beeson, Regent Broad, I would say that the conversations we've had with the key thought leaders on this have been very positive so far. Great. Thank you. Regent Frobenius. Uh, thank you, Chair Beeson. Uh, like Regent Johnson, when I'm back in Stearns County and talk to my Stearns County friends, I get a lot of comments about the profitability of alcohol at the at the university, and I've enjoyed at the stadium, and I've enjoyed kidding President Kaler that I would hope that he could get eventually do as well at, at the TCF Stadium as the St. Cloud Rotary Club does at its summer music festival. <laughs> uh, uh, different audience, uh, but I uh, I really do want to commend the staff as to how they've managed this process through several years. We, we went into this and we didn't want to do it a certain way and we had our issue with the legislature and we worked out a compromise and we did an excellent job, in my opinion, of, uh, of managing this transition. Um, and it was a costly transition and we took an awful lot of care with it. And I think it, every bit of care we took was very, very appropriate. So I'm, I'm fine with all of that. Um, I want to support Regent Simmons' comment, though, about uh, the profit is not the goal of this venture. We are providing an amenity. Uh, I think you staff is making the appropriate steps to, to work with this and to implement it, and I agree with their implementation plan, and I just urge our staff to continue to work with this to keep it functioning at an appropriate amenity and not let, not let it get out of line. And I think that's the intent that I certainly hear. So. Congratulations to you for working that out and for making a profit on alcohol, finally. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Regent Allen. Uh, I, my comments are along that line, too. I, I always enjoy Regent Johnson's comments, and I basically agree with them, but I don't want them to overshadow Regent Simmons's point, uh, which uh, Regent Fermini has just reiterated, too, that we are not in this to, uh, to make money. It's to provide the expected experience that our public has and as long as it remains under control, as it appears to be, that's great. If it gets out of control, we will have to look at it again. Regent Cohen. Thank you, Chair Beeson. Well, I had two comments from, from colleagues that I wanted to reinforce, and one of them has already been reinforced by two other regions, so I won't do that. Uh, but I do want to talk about what Regent Devine brought up, and that's the slide that's on the screen right now, that despite a, a fairly uh, I don't see it as significant decline uh, in our student alcohol use. The alcohol use is still astoundingly high. And I don't want to lose sight that if over one in three of our students is high risk drinking uh, <clears throat> in the previous two weeks, that's a large number. So I just want to applaud you and uh, encourage you to continue every effort that we can think of to minimize our alcohol drinking, which I know is so difficult in the college age group, but I still think, uh, I think we're headed in the right direction, but I really want to keep going in that direction. So thank you for those efforts. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Final comment, Regent Johnson. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, clarification, so it's not misunderstood. I wholeheartedly support 
uh, Regent Cohn's comments, Regent Allen, Fabinius, and uh, Simmons. I don't want you, you know, to read clergy supports liquor profits or something like that. Uh, That's going to be the headlines. I just think if we're going to do it, at least make make a buck, okay? You know, and use that profit for uh, alcohol education or something like that. I understand the magnitude of uh, the problems with alcohol, okay? And but if we're going to do it, and as Regent Fabinius has said, uh, it's manage it in the appropriate uh, and right way. So thank you. Thank you, presenters, and all the work that's led up to uh, this uh, this uh, outcome. We'll go on now to the uh, reports of our committees, and I'll ask Regent Allen to give the report of the Facilities and Operation Committee, which was busy uh, and active. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. We had two action items. Uh, first of all, schematic design for the TCF Bank Stadium improvements. Uh, we unanimously approved and recommend for this group approval of the schematic plans for TCF Bank Stadium improvements. They include uh, replacing the existing artificial turf, uh, changing logos and markings, uh, installing a field heating system, winterizing many spaces throughout the building, uh, building out some storage space, uh, and camera platforms, among others. I move the approval. There is a motion and there is a second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. The uh, second action item regards campus uh, safety. Uh, the committee unanimously recommends approval of a resolution to reallocate facility management repair and replacement funds to invest at least $4.1 million for use on campus safety projects. Uh, includes uh, additional lighting, exterior cameras, uh, converting all buildings on the Twin City campus to electric, uh, electronic card access. I move the approval of the resolution. Second. There is a motion and second, and there is discussion. Regent Devine, would you like to care to? Yeah, I would just like to comment. You know, uh, yesterday at the committee meeting, there was a lot of discussion about this issue, and there's been, this is really the, the, uh, the culmination of many months of hard, hard effort, and I think it needs to be recognized right now at this moment about the uh, great leadership that we've provided here on campus to uh, deal with this issue. And I want to reiterate the fact that this monetary commitment that you're about to approve um, affirms really the board's complete uh, support of the president and his uh, uh, agenda and uh, for Vice President Wheelock that they have the resources necessary to do what needs to be done here to address on an ongoing basis any of the issues that re re resolve on, um, on student safety, on faculty, employees here at the University of Minnesota. And I think that the evidence uh, that was also uh, talked about yesterday that the leadership that the university is providing in this area in coordinating these many complicated levels of government that are involved in this. Minneapolis Police, the uh, Hennepin County Sheriff's Office, University Police, Transit Police. It's a complicated process to be involved with and the leadership that the university and the president has provided has been significant and uh, that um, now we're affirming the resources that go with that and it needs to be noted right now that and it's appreciated I think by a number of people. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Devine. Regent Lucas. Thank you, Chair Beeson. Um, of course, I totally support this, but I'd like to suggest that maybe our uh, effort doesn't stop here. And uh, the 1,700 cameras that we have uh, on campus sounds like a lot, but the technology of these video cameras has changed so much that it's uh, night and day. So I hope that we go on and look at the quality of our cameras and make sure that they can pick out features and license plates and all the things that the old cameras couldn't do. So perhaps in another meeting we can have an update on the condition of the cameras. Thank you, Regent Lucas. Regent Allen's motion is on the table and has been seconded. Is there any further discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those against, that motion carries. We also uh, received information on technology planning for the near-term, mid-term, and long-term uh, strategies. Uh, that was a short presentation given our busy schedule, and I think we uh, intend to come back and uh, revisit that uh, in the near-term uh, future. 
Uh, we also received a report on sustainability and energy management. This used to come to us as two separate reports. It was combined this time. It was an excellent report. Uh, some of the highlights include the fact that uh, from 2008 to 2012, we've had a 22% decrease in greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, that is excellent. Uh, the significance, uh, because powering, heating, and cooling buildings account for 80% of the university's carbon footprint, so we've made uh, excellent progress there. Uh, we reviewed a number of other items. It was an excellent report, and we will continue to come back to those items. Uh, one final information item, uh, TCF ba Stadium Bank improvements, uh, stadium improvements, which was discussed as part of that first action. That concludes my report. Thank you, Regent Allen. Next will be a report of the Faculty and Student Affairs Committee. Regent Ferbenius. Thank you, Chair Beeson. Um, first under the consent report, the committee split the consent report into three items for action as follows. Number one, the committee unanimously recommends approval of two amendments to the fa faculty retirement plan. First is amendment of section 1.04 of the faculty retirement plan to include all summer research and instructional earnings as eligible for retirement plan contributions, regardless of funding source. I move approval of that amendment. Second. There is a motion and second on that. Any discussion? Not hearing any, all those in favor say aye. 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 Against? No. Motion? No. Regent Broad votes no. Motion carries. Regent Verbenius. Uh, second amendment is number uh, two, amendment of sections 1.06 and 2.01 and Appendix A of the Faculty Retirement Plan to eliminate the waiting period for professional and administrative employees to participate in the plan. All other groups uh, uh, do not have such a waiting period. I move approval of the amendments. Second. There is a motion and second. Is there any discussion on this? Regent Broad. M Mr. Chairman, I actually thought you had them both in the rep together again. I actually meant to vote no on this one, vote yes on the last one. My apologies. Okay, we will reverse uh, Regent Broad's vote on the previous vote. <laughs> and uh, on this vote, is there any other discussion? Not hear any. All those in favor say aye. 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 Against? No. Regent Broad votes no on this motion. Thank you. Uh, the committee unanimously recommends approval of the appointment of Dr. John J. Coleman as Dean of the College of Liberal Arts on the Twin City campus, effective July 31st. Dr. Coleman holds a PhD in political science from, M from MIT and comes to us from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I move the appoint approval of the appointment of Dr. Coleman. Second. There's a motion and second. Is there any, any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Um, the committee reviewed, uh, under our discussion items, the committee reviewed a proposed repeal of the board's policy on death benefits and will act on that at our next meeting. Uh, this was adopted in 1945 and provides for payment of one month's salary for certain faculty and staff who die while employed by the university. Benefit was essentially replaced by the university's life insurance benefit and over time has been negotiated out of all but one labor contract. We will act on this policy in May. We heard results of the 2013 employee engagement survey. The news is exciting and very positive. Response rates were at record levels for the university as Professor Will Durfee commented during his report earlier. Um, 60% of staff and 47% of faculty responded. And the university scored above private sector norms for indicators related to, to commitment and dedication. It's also good to see that the engagement results are being supported by a very specific action plans down to the supervisor level wherever possible. Management did re, uh, share with us their plans for following up on this survey and the committee did request interim reports uh, prior to the report of, of the next year's survey, the progress uh, being made to to work with this area, this very, very important area. We also received a primer on employee relations that covered such thing as PELRA -E and Fair Labor Standards Act and a variety of sort of conflicting rules and regulation and policy that we have on some employee relations issues. Um, and that was helpful to us to give a framework for some uh, issues that will be coming down in the weeks and the months ahead. We also got an update on the positive outcomes of the Work Plus Pilot Project in the Dunhow Building, 
which has redesigned workspace for some employees in the Office of Human Resources to reflect what they do and how they do it. And you find that a fascinating project, and you'll see that uh, type of facility space uh, revision uh, probably occur in a few other places around the university. <laughs> uh, Mr. Chair, that con concludes my report. Thank you, Regent Forbenius. Next is the report of the Finance Committee, Regent McMillan. Thank you, Chair Beeson. The Finance Committee met yesterday morning, and we have two action items and a few non-action items, uh, the first being one that's familiar to the committee and the board, the long-term financing to support the Ambulatory Care Center. The university will be, has agreed to finance construction of that contingent upon receipt of corporate guarantees from UMP and Fairview. And the committee unanimously recommends approval of the financing resolution authorizing the issuance and sale of bonds in the principal amount of up to 165 million Five hundred thousand dollars. I move its approval. Second. There is a motion and second on that authorization to issue bonds. Any discussion? Not hearing any. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carries. Regent McMillan. Thank you. Our second uh, action item comes from the consent report, and uh, we have recommend the approval of the consent report, which includes allocations from the general contingency greater than $250,000. That relates to safety, spending on uh, student, staff, and employee safety. And the second is uh, purchase of goods and services over a million dollars. That relates to a vendor for the enterprise system upgrade. I move its approval. Second. There is a motion and second now. Is there any discussion on this matter? Not hearing any of all those in favor say aye. 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 Yes. Motion passes. And quickly, we heard, uh, we discussed and received information on four topics, a very robust discussion around expanded reporting for our endowment fund relating to sustainability and renewables. This is just, these are all non-action items. And then annual reports on capital financing, debt management, peer comparisons for the university's endowments and investments, and uh, lastly, insurance and risk management. That concludes our report. Thank you for the report, Regent McMillan. Regent Simmons, did you give us a report of the Academic and Student Affairs Committee? Thank you, Chair Beeson. Uh, the committee unanimously recommends approval of the proposed changes to the Re Board of Regent policy, commercialization of intellectual property rights. I move adoption of the revised policy. Second. There's a motion and second on the proposed revision policy. Is there any discussion of that? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. In a second action motion item. Carries. Oh, sorry. Yeah. In a second action item, the committee uh, unanimously recommends approval of the consent report, which includes new academic programs and program changes, program deletions and discontinuations. And I would note one particular program, the Master of Science Patent Law degree in the law school is a real response to market, both in terms of the demands of the students and the need of, needs of business. I move approval. Second. Regional Mari seconds that motion. Is there any discussion? All for a vote. Those in favor say aye. 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 Against? Motion carries. Regent Simmons. Thank you. Um, we had a, a, a presentation of a remarkable set of uh, interdisciplinary research projects at the university that really tie together a lot of what we've heard about today um, from the faculty, from research. And these three projects were, um, one was on the Minnesota Global Food Venture, the second one was on neuromodulation to treat brain conditions, and the third on the Resilient Communities Project. These initiatives engage multiple faculty members uh, across multiple uh, departments and disciplines within the university and also receive catalysts from, um, from MenDrive. So very exciting to see they have a lot of promise and we'll be interested in tracking where they go. That concludes my report. Thank you, Regent Simmons. Report of the audit oh, committee. I'm sorry, that's not true. Can I say something more? Yes, you may. Quickly. We had an important report, um, our annual report on graduate education and a good discussion around that with topics to come back. And finally, we reviewed the discussion we'd had in December on tuition and financial aid philosophy and uh, approved the minutes that describe that. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Simmons. Regent Broad, report the audit committee. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The audit committee met and we have one action item today. The, um, the committee unanimously uh, recommends approval of the amendments to the Board of Regents policy, the audit committee charter, which includes new language to address the committee's oversight responsibility for compliance and increase the threshold for the committee's review of audit contracts from 25,000 to 100,000. I move its approval. Second. The motion second to amend the charter of the audit committee is there uh, any discussion about that? Would all those in favor say aye? Aye. 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 Against no? Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Right. Chairman. We also had some non-action items, and we had an overview of the fiduciary responsibilities of nonprofit audit committee members. We, the committee heard from Jay Kedrowski, a senior fellow at Public and Nonprofit Leadership Center at the Humphrey, Public, Humphrey School of Public Affairs here at the University of Minnesota, who talked to us about three areas of governance, fiduciary responsibilities, uh, strategic responsibilities, and generative uh, responsibilities and a few key points that he left us, and this was a really uh, a fantastic conversation, not just a, a presentation, but a conversation relative to our role as a regent in governance. Uh, the board should be strategic, shifting from conformance to performance was one of the key points. We should really focus on asking the question, and then also working in collaboration with the president to assess controversial issues and determine policy changes, but I'm sure the president will appreciate this and do not micromanage or micro-govern uh, along the way. We also heard uh, two of the additional risk profiles, one from the health sciences, Vice President Aaron Friedman discussed the health sciences risk profile and highlighted several key areas of risk, including recruiting and retaining top talent and faculty, declining research funding, information technology and privacy risks, and limited uh, clinical training sites. We also um, heard a uh, the, another risk uh, profile from the compliance area, and the Director of Institutional Compliance, Lynn Zentner, discussed the compliance risk profile relative to accounting for controls that are in place. And the only area that remained high risk after these accounting uh, controls were put in place is really human subjects, research, and clinical trials. Um, and again, these are just uh, two additional uh, risk profiles in a series of risk profiles that uh, the administration has been working on um, and have been, I think, a valuable tool for us. We had an internal uh, audit update. Uh, Associate Vice President Klatt gave an internal audit update relative to activities and um, talked about the progress towards completion of the annual audit plan um, being slightly behind, but certainly uh, moving forward in terms of uh, satisfaction uh, relative to that progress. Uh, last information items we received were an external auditor's review and report of engagements with accounting firms. And Mr. Chairman, that concludes my report. Thank you, Regent Broad. Report of the Litigation Review Committee, Regent Larson. Um, the committee met yesterday, uh, and we did not have any action items, but we did um, review and discuss um, a number of uh, attorney-client privilege. Thank you, Regent Larson, for that report. Regent Cullen, the Special Committee on Academic Medicine. Well, I may have the longest report of the day. The committee did not meet. <laughs> yes. Okay, we, uh, we're doing pretty well on time here. Um, we're, uh, I'll ask for any old business, any new business. Well, this brings us to the conclusion. I'd like to I'd like to thank the staff and the board members for really a strong uh, couple of days of discussion and action and work. And uh, I'd like to uh, uh, invite everybody to have a great Valentine's Day with their significant other and enjoy the upcoming weekend. This meeting is adjourned. <laughs>